<laughs> Welcome to Anti-Colonial Interventions in Legal Culture, our one-day hybrid event on law and humanities from the Global South. I am Hector Rojos, Professor of Latin American and Comparative Literature here at Stanford. Alongside PhD candidate Joseph Wager, who co-authored the present intro remarks, I would like to thank you all for making the trip and uh, those who are following on Zoom uh, for devoting part of your day or night to participating remotely. We would not be here were it not for Joe's leadership, MTL, that's Modern Thought and Literature, grad students, Namrata, Pertisi, and Alberto Quintero's time commitment, Melanie McDonald and Sara Clemente's administrative support, core funding from Global Studies, as well as co-sponsorship from two departments, English and Iberian and Latin American cultures, and four centers, Latin American studies, where we are housed, ethics in society, the Center for the Humanities, and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. Our efforts today will feed the next edition of the journal, Occasion, whose managing editor is Ezra Olson. Yes. Let me unpack the title of our proceedings, Anti-Colonial Interventions in Legal Culture from the Global South. Let's try and parcel out one of these uh, at a time. Uh, law and Humanities is well established by now as an interdiscipline, and it does not generate much thought on the Global South and much less from it. Readers, that is, edited collections by Bernie Myler and Liz Anker in 2017, as several of you will recall and have participated in, or more recently, uh, Bernie's again, this time with uh, Delmar and Stern's 2020 reader, confirmed it. Kindred projects such as David Babcock and Peter Lehman's 2019 valuable dossier for the Journal of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies, or Shane Palmer's and Sundia Pahuda Rutledge Handbook of International Law and the Humanities can only scratch at the surface. So the, the more encompassing readings, uh, readers really don't have that much featured on the Global South or from it as in authors from the region. And then those, those few uh, contributions that currently exist in the literature um, are you know, uh, amazing, but there's just so much more to, to do. I think that's summarizing very succinctly the state of the, of the discipline as, as I can uh, see it. Um, yes, here we are at a major research institution in the affluent United States, but the goal is to engage the non-affluent South as an episteme. What results from this purposeful dislocation is hopefully dialectic and not contradictory. The site of enunciation has less to do with a geographical marker than with being the subject of extraction rather than its beneficiary. As A.G. Maller helpfully summarizes, we are dealing with, I quote, the resistant imaginary of a transnational political subject that results from a shared experience of subjugation under contemporary global capitalism, end of quote. Uh, if you're wonder, wondering where we could locate the Global South in some ways, and I kind of go into detail right here, right now, you could find it right across the highway, right across Highway 101 in East Palo Alto. If you just read the news about the goings on and the differences between Palo Alto and East Palo Alto, your uh, mind is blown, uh, especially speaking here at the Center for Latin American Studies where Spanish is part of our academic uh, um, you know, proceedings. There will surely be different takes on the interdiscipline of law and humanities itself today among us from the well-trodden and ever important humanization of the law to the analysis of the law as literary theme but I suspect the core operation will be heuristic. What emerges from reading legal sources alongside art in their tension rather than the, in the impossible subsumption of one to the other? The couplet legal culture typically refers to something that is lacking, less than law, not formalized or codified. And yet the law cannot enact itself or operate in a vacuum. When I floated by Joe, the thought that many locales in the global South rely on legal culture for lack of formal instruments, he was quick to point out that legal culture is always there in the background 
and that one could well learn from less or differently codified milieus about what actually takes place where rule of law is said to prevail. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, as the Colombian legal scholar Daniel Bonilla puts it, law is not the product of culture, but part of it. On the other, systems based on jurisprudence in the Anglo-American tradition are easily fetishized. The capacity of intervention, the word intervention in our convening title, is a given. Why? Because words cannot not have an effect. Sarah Ahmed's notion of non-performativity. <coughs> this is in keeping with Sylvia Winter's description of culture as, I quote, the societal machiner ma machinery with which a particular society or a group symbolically codes its co-identifying sense of self with reference to which it then acts both individually and collectively upon the world, end of quote. In Winter's refreshing take, agency is distributed. Scholars, no less than anyone else, reclaim their effect on a state of affairs. Additionally, because the legal and the literary imagination go hand in hand, it behooves us to serve as interpreters and fellow travelers for the innovations that, in one domain, can shed light on the other. Anti-colonial. Anti-colonial thinking has existed as long as there has been colonialism, as Anne Gulick reminds us in a 2016 volume. In a similar vein, Adam Gerechu and Karuna Mantena have engaged in a project of conceptual reanimation in conversation with Gandhi and Fanon. So that was recently added as well in 2021. Still, the term anti-colonial has gained a life of its own in the last few years. It sublates debates surrounding the post and de-colonial being arguably more ecumenic than those already institutionalized prefixes. The gist is to counter the deleterious lingering effects of various forms of colonialism proper, as in by occupying empires, and economic neo-colonialism, as in capitalist hegemony. There are many aspects to this, including deeply rooted ways of thinking, which present company is particularly well poised to challenge. Let us then assume that the premise of our colloquium is correct. There can be anti-colonial interventions, illegal culture from the global south. Now, what are the limits and affordances of such interventions? What might they have in common? And how can this be distilled into an encompassing theory? Or would that be perhaps a less desirable outcome than formulating a robust, robust case history? As the day progresses, I invite everyone to think about the conceptual uptake of your specific arguments and how this stacks up next to other speakers, the better to capture and debate this during the closing round table. In Jarvis McInnes's work, we will encounter counter geographies of power. In Lila Neri, literary history cessations that embrace non-human temporality as much as the time of the commodity. In Luis Cargamo Wechante, a collaborative collectivist model of scholarship attuned to the sounds of challenging the nation state as arbiter of law. In Miguel Rabago Dorbeker, a reappraisal of the global 1968 phenomenon anchored in Mexico City and its competing memorializations. In Yogi Tagoya, a reckoning with the increasingly wandering category of caste across India and the United States. Together, your contributions, dear speakers, and those of our respondents, thank you also for being with us today, will speak a different language, perhaps, of emancipation. In short, we have a feast ahead of us, so let us begin. If you do the, I think, I think you're going to do some introductions, Joe? Yes. Yes, and then we'll. So our first speaker, uh, Jarvis McInnes, is the Cordelia and William Laverack 
Family Assistant Professor of English at Duke University. He is an interdisciplinary scholar of African American and African diaspora literature and culture with teaching and research interests in the global South, primarily the US South and the Caribbean. Sound studies, performance studies, and visual culture. His latest essay, A Reorder of Things in Black Studies, Sacred Praxis, Phono Geography, and the Counter Archive of Diaspora was awarded the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora's Outstanding Article Prize. And as a respondent, we have Vaughn Raspberry, an assistant professor of English at Stanford University, where he teaches in collaboration with the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. His teaching and research focus on African American literature, post colonial theory, and philosophical theories of modernity. And Vaughn was recently appointed the Associate Vice Provost of Graduate Education. So, Jack, please. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you all so much um, to uh, Joe uh, for reaching out and inviting me and, and Hector uh, as well. I'm really happy to be here. It's my first time at Stanford. It's a beautiful, beautiful campus and really excited to be a part of this conversation. Uh, I, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to think about the legal uh, components and aspects uh, of, my, of my work. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces um, and to meet so many new um, colleagues as well. Uh, so, uh, and of course, Vaughn, thank you so much for coming to provide some remarks. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, there we go, we'll start there. <clears throat> so this uh, talk is, is in three parts, uh, beginning with a, a, a quick sort of close reading of uh, Colson Whitehead's uh, The Underground Railroad, and I'll move to a section that attempts to think through uh, the, the garden plot, um, the provision ground, um, <clears throat> drawing on historians and legal scholars uh, of Jamaica and of the U.S. South, and then I'll think through how it applies to, uh, opens up, what it opens up for thinking comparatively across the U.S. South and the Caribbean, um, a, a region I call the Global Black South, and I'll get to, which, I'll, which I'll get to momentarily. Okay. In Colson Whitehead's 2016 novel, The Underground Railroad, the protagonist, um, Cora, uh, is tethered to her family's garden plot. Cora inherited the plot from her mother, Mabel, who had inherited it from her mother, Ajari. Um, and Ajari had made the course uh, transatlantic journey from West Africa to the US South, to Georgia in particular. Upon arriving to the uh, Randall Plantation uh, in Georgia, Ajari se secured the garden plot. <clears throat> when Ajari planted there, soon after her long march to the plantation, the plot was a rumble of dirt and scrub behind her cabin. Soon she transformed it into a garden plot that was tied almost ontologically uh, to her very sense of self. The novel describes the significance of Ajari's plot thusly. White men squabble before judges over claims uh, to this or that tract hundreds of miles away that, that had been carved up on a map. Slaves fought with equal fervor over their tiny parcels at their feet. The strip between the cabin was a place to tie a goat build a chicken coop, uh, a spot to grow food to fill your belly on top of the mash doled out by the kitchen every morning. <clears throat> Importantly, the plot was not a utopic space on the Randall Plantation. It was a contested geography among the enslaved. It was yours only uh, if you got there first, Whitehead writes. When Randall and later his sons got, got a notion to sell you, the contract wasn't dry before someone had snatched up your plot seeing you out there in the evening calm, smiling or humming might give your uh, neighbor an idea to coerce uh, you from your claim using methods of intimidation, various provocations. Uh, who would hear your appeal? There were no judges here, but my mother wouldn't let them touch her field. Uh, Mabel uh, told her daughter, Cora, field in jest as a jarry stake was scarcely three yards square said she'd dig a hammer in their heads if they so much as looked at it. The image of her grandmother assaulting another slave didn't jive with Cora's recollections of the woman, but once she started tending to the plot, she understood the truth of the portrait. <clears throat> like Ajari, when Mabel, Cora's mother, assumed ownership of the plot, it became tied to her very sense of self. 
when, when Mabel escaped from Randall, it was the food she grew on her plot that, that sustained her. Um, this is Whitehead again. Mabel had packed for her adventure, a machete, flint and tinder. She stole a cabin made shoes, which were in better shape. For, for weeks, her empty garden testified to her miracle. Before she lit up, she dug out, she dug up every, excuse me, before she lit out, she dug up every yam from their plot, a cumbersome load and ill-advised uh, for a journey that required a fleet foot. The lumps and burrows in the dirt were a reminder to all who walked by. Then one morning, they were smooth over. Cora got on her knees and planted anew. It was her inheritance. Um, and <clears throat> uh, a jar, excuse me, Mabel took a turnip from her sack. It was young and tender soft, and she took a bite. This is once she had escaped. Uh, the sweetest crop she'd ever raised in a jar's plot, even with the taste of marsh water. Her mother had left her that in her inheritance, at least a tiny plot to watch over. You're supposed to pass on something useful to your children. The better parts of Ajari never took root in Mabel, her indomitability, her perseverance, but there was a plot three yards square and the hardy stuff that sprouted from it. Her mother had protected it with all her heart, the most valuable land in all of Georgia. That, that Mabel used the food from her plot to, to sustain her escape recalls another meaning of the plot, right? To plot an escape or insurrection, uh, reminding us that, this, that slave garden plots could be sites of, of insurgency and resistance, um, as I will explore later. Uh, when Cora inherits Ajari's and Mabel's plot, uh, she too guards it fiercely. Cultivating it helped her grieve the fact that during her escape from Randall, Mabel, uh, Mabel had left Cora behind, and we learn we learn otherwise um, as the novel uh, continues. Um, when Mabel vanished, Cora, be uh, Cora became astray. In Cora's shop, the world drained to gray impressions. The first color to return was the simmering brown red of the soil in her family's plot. It reawakened her to people and things, and she decided to hold on to her stake even though she was young and small and nobody to look after her anymore. She fought for the dirt. There were small pests, the ones too, too young for real work. Cora shooed off these children, trampling her, um, her, her sprouts and yelled at them for digging up her yam slips, using the same tone she used at Jockey's Feast to, to corral them into foot races and games. She handled them with good nature. On the plot, Cora, and I quote, owned herself for a few hours every week, um, was how she looked at it, to tug weeds, pluck caterpillars, thin out the sour greens, and glare at anyone planning incursions on her territory, end quote. When Blake, a fellow enslaved person on the, on the Randall Plantation, built a doghouse in the center of Cora's plot, effectively seizing and dispossessing her of her quote-unquote property, Cora recalled Ajari's threat to, quote, knock open the head of anyone who messed with your land. She proceeded to take a hatchet to the, to the doghouse, despite Blake's much larger size and inclination to violence, protecting the, the little property she owned, however ambiguously she owned it, was worth the risk of Blake's retaliation. So in the Underground Railroad, uh, Whitehead figures the plot as a site of quasi-property ownership, uh, inheritance, ontological reclamation, and fugitive resistance among enslaved peoples in the US South. However, these slave garden plots, um, also known as provision grounds, existed throughout the Americas, or, or what I call the Global Black South. Um, it's a hemispheric geography that includes the US South, uh, the Caribbean, and parts of Latin America. And I'm happy to say more about my conceptualization of the Global Black South later, but for now, I'll just say that it intervenes in um, global South studies by considering the U.S. South as a part of the global South, uh, especially in relation to the Caribbean and Latin America, based on a similar history of slavery uh, and the plantation and the underdevelopment that often ensued in its wake. So it was actually really, um, uh, I was really excited, excited to hear you say, well, not excited, but useful to hear you frame the global South as just across the street, even though we're um, at Stanford and in the United States, a land of wealth. So this paper, this paper turns to contemporary African-American and, Car and Caribbean literatures and theory to one, examine the plot, pro plot provision ground as a diaspora geography that connects Afro-descended peoples navigating the afterlife of the plantation in the global Black South, and two, 
to interrogate the paradoxical relationship between quasi-property ownership and subsistence farming on the plot to notions of legal personhood and ontological reclamation of what I call eco-ontology during slavery and its aftermath. So much of the scholarship on the plot or provision ground in Black studies has focused on the Caribbean and especially Jamaica. This is likely because in the British Caribbean colonies, the plot was far more systematized and was eventually legalized, uh, creating in the West Indies uh, the largest class of enslaved um, descendant property owners in the Americas. In the 18th century, the British Parliament passed legislation requiring planters in its Caribbean colonies to allot enslaved people's uh, garden plot to grow food, to feed and sustain themselves. These small parcels were often on the outskirts of plantations and on lands too poor for sugarcane cultivation. While the enslaved were not rights-bearing subjects effectively positioned outside of the category of legal personhood, these plots or provision grounds became liminal spaces that paradoxically allowed property to own property. According to legal scholars Eleanor Brown and Ian Ayres, in 1755, the British Parliament instructed the colonial office that, um, that governors in charge of the West Indian colonies should provide assurances that plantations uh, would dedicate estate lands to local food production. This mandate uh, led to the development of the provision system. Uh, formal legislative action followed later, um, <clears throat> uh, such, such that an English governor Sought to institution, who sought to institutionalize this practice many decades after it had already emerged in Jamaica, um, uh, issued instructions that any plantation owner who acquired a new plantation would be obligated to uh, allocate individual plots to enslaved people to feed their families. And then a later governor of Jamaica also uh, um, issued explicit instructions that not only should each enslaved person have his own plot of arable land, but he should also be provided time off to work the land and that the proceeds of the plot should be his. Um, moreover, under this law, both the plot and the enslaved person's uh, time in cultivating his plot were protected from trespass. Brown and Ayers uh, further argue that provisioning can be uh, thus seen as a kind of internal subcontracting in which plantation owners gave enslaved people both de facto property rights and time to cultivate the land, as well as de facto contracting rights to sell any surplus food in exchange for enslaved people taking on the obligation to feed themselves. Um, <clears throat> and they, they, they argue, um, and many others argue that this idea of having enslaved people uh, to feed themselves, right, was, was also, um, it, it was not um, uh, a part of the giving or assigning or allotting uh, enslaved people plots uh, was not altruism, right? Obviously, right? It was putting the burden of feeding oneself back on one's back on the enslaved people. So uh, provisioning represented a decentralized form of food production. Um, <clears throat> they conclude by, by which an individual enslaved person was given a form of real property, discretion on how to utilize it and rights to sell any surplus. Um, so enslaved people not only worked uh, their plots to feed themselves and their families, but also sold their surplus in local markets. And according to historian Vincent Brown, and, um, enslaved peoples in Jamaica negotiated uh, assiduously to, ex to extend their customary right to pass on goods and livestock, to include the right to bequeath land as well to, to their family members upon death. Inheritance rights for the enslaved, though never secure in law until the last years of slavery, were won through the consolidation of, of ambiguous customary rights uh, and the occupation of territory claimed as, fam as family land. Brown can, continues, justice masters conceded the right to slave semi-autonomous commercial life. They allowed informal inheritance rights. Enslaved men and women made their last wishes known verbally to trusted kin, friends, or authority figures who administered the deceased's effects without the sanction of law. Legators passed on currency and livestock to whomever they pleased, and over time, even began to will gardens and provision grounds, uh, provided that the devisees um, lived on the same estate. So, so planters essentially, uh, again, gave enslaved people's de facto property interests in, um, in these family plots. Um, 
and um, the provision plot system came to provide enslaved people uh, with some version of each of these uh, of, of the attributes that we typically associate uh, uh, between uh, property and, and personhood um, and constituted a kind of private property system. Um, so the plot enabled enslaved peoples to own, exchange, and bequeath property, even as they were property themselves. Um, the plot is where enslaved peoples contested and contradicted their status as property. Uh, through tilling the soil, growing food, and perhaps even beautifying the landscape, they reclaimed their bodies, their time, and forged a more ethical relation to the earth than the extractive one enforced by the plantation owners. Significantly, as slaveholders allowed slaves to hire out their skills, market their crops and livestock and keep their profits, the enslaved came to view their internal economy as a right. Um, <clears throat> in this way, the plot and the subsistence and marketing practices that it engendered became a site of negotiation between enslaved peoples and their, and their owners. Once these rights were granted, enslaved peoples resisted any attempts to withdraw them. For instance, on a Baha'ian uh, sugar plantation in 1790, a group of runaway slaves put forth conditions for their surrender, listing as a condition for returning to plantation labor the days of Friday and Saturday to work for themselves, right? So advocating for time to work their plots and the right to plant uh, uh, rice where, wherever they wished and in any marsh without asking per, uh, permission from the planters to do so. Um, the case of Jamaica is particularly striking. Uh, in the 1780s, William Beckford noticed how reluctant slaves were to resign those houses that were built by their ancestors for, uh, to forego those grounds that were settled by their forefathers and which have been handed down for years and become the inheritance of the same family, right? So their, um, their uh, attachment uh, to, to these plots uh, was, quite, was quite striking. In 1832, William Burge, who was a coffee planter, Jamaica agent and former attorney general of the island, conveyed the following to the House of Lords. A slave being once put into possession of his provision grounds considers them completely his own property, and he is allowed to dispose of them to such of his family as he pleases. Those acquainted with, with Jamaica know, um, Burge continued, that if from any cause it becomes uh, necessary to remove the slaves from one property to another, or even change their provision grounds on the same property, the greatest difficulty is found in reconciling them to the removal um, um, or change. Indeed, planters paid what Burge thought to be considerable sums to enslaved landholders in compensation for lost grounds. A person having to remove slaves must first of all furnish them with new houses and plant new grounds for them and give them a compensation for the grounds they have already independently, um, uh, they, excuse me, they have already independently of their being at, at, at liberty to go back and take all the provisions remaining in those grounds. So, so the plot provision ground was ultimately a paradoxical geography. Though uh, through customary rights and de facto property ownership, the plot was enslaved people's entree into becoming rights bearing subjects and sometimes afforded them in uneven ways, the rights of legal personhood, even as they were property themselves and their land claims were still tethered to the plantation, land that uh, in, in, that in fact uh, um, de jure belonged to the planter and could be fully reclaimed if the enslaved person was sold to another owner. Um, so, so, so the plot is where enslaved peoples may have first experienced or experimented, and I want to hold on to that term experimentation. I'm going to come back to it uh, later when I get to, to Tuskegee, um, with, with the relation between property and legal personhood for themselves, rather than functioning as objects of property who um, constituted their owner's wealth and shored up their own relationship to legal, legal personhood. So, so in my forthcoming uh, manuscript, uh, Afterlives of the Plantation, Plotting Agrarian Futures in the Global Black South, I, I explore the plot as a geography that existed throughout the Global Black South, linking the experiences of enslaved peoples and their descendants in the Caribbean and the, and the U.S. South. But to do so, I want to uh, take a moment to um, uh, uh, wrestle with or to share the, the differences between the way that the plot um, existed in the Caribbean and the way that it existed in the South. So, so for African-Americans in the U.S. South, the plot was, was protected by neither law nor custom. Um, while enslaved peoples in the Southern United States also planted gardens to supplement their meager uh, food 
provisions on plantations, planters were not legally obligated to allot them parcels for, um, uh, to grow their food. Thus the practice was, was more uneven and unsystematic. Uh, there were no consistent rules about the size of, of the plots or the pattern of allotment or what slaves could grow in them. Uh, when it came to allotting slaves land, um, um, variety was the slave owner's hallmark. Um, some masters carefully allotted each slave family a separate patch, but others simply set aside what they called a nigger field um, and, and left the slaves to sort out their claims. We might think of of Cora's experience on the Randall Plantation is more akin to that experience. As Whitehead writes uh, in the Underground Railroad, there was no recall, uh, there, there was no recourse, were no laws, but the ones rewritten every day. Uh, furthermore, because enslaved peoples did, did not own land by custom and certainly not juridically, they could not borrow against them to expand their, their operations. Um, and so in, in the claims of kinfolk, uh, Dylan C. Penningroth actually recounts an instance where, uh, recounts a story where an, um, a formerly enslaved man is, is reflecting on the purpose of the provision ground um, in, in North Carolina. And, and he says that while the, his um, owner had actually given, actually allotted parts of the forest to enslaved peoples, uh, the, the, um, the enslaved people, he basically used it as a way for the enslaved people to clear that land. And then once it was cleared and, and once it was productive, he sort of moved them to a new plot, right? Um, so it's a, a, it's a striking difference between the ways that um, um, Afro-Jamaicans or that enslaved people in Jamaica actually felt like that they owned those plots uh, and refused to be uh, where they could, obviously, refused to be moved from plot to plot. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So as, as in Jamaica, slave property rights were, were, were subsumed under the ultimate sovereignty of slave owners. In Whitehead's The Underground Railroad, Cora comes to this realization once she has escaped from the Randall Plantation. Cora thought of her garden back on Randall, the plot she cherished. Now she saw it for the joke it was, a tiny square of dirt that had convinced her she owned something. It was hers like the cotton she seeded, weeded, and picked was hers. Her plot was a shadow of something that lived elsewhere out of sight. The paradoxical nature of the plot provision ground that wedged enslaved peoples between a status, their, their status as property and as property, quasi-property owners um, uh, um, obtained in the U.S. South as well. Um, and, the, and the historical record is rife with all kinds of contradictions. Um, where a North Carolina Supreme Court uh, spoke approvingly of a master who paid his slaves for cotton that they produced on their patches. Um, and uh, while no law ever formally recognized slaves' ownership of property, many Southern towns uh, had, had laws to regulate slaves' marketing of property, right? So it kind of reminds us of the ways that, um, it, why would it need to be legally, um, uh, why would there need to be laws to, to uh, determine the parameters of slave property ownership if uh, enslaved people could not own property mm -hmm. in the first place, right? Um, so um, <clears throat> as in the Caribbean, slave owned property and the arrangements of land and labor from which it came were part of an important regional formal, formal economy within the more formal economies of the plantation and the city. Ultimately in the US South, enslaved people did in fact own property and engaged uh, in an informal economy, though unlike their counterparts in the Caribbean, they did not enjoy the same legal, legal protections. So, so but, but still the plot serves similar practical functions in both the British Caribbean and the US South, right? To, to supplement enslaved people's poor diets and allowing them to accumulate small sums of property and cash that in turn enabled them to participate in, in an informal economy or even purchase their freedom. So I wanna highlight um, another function of the plot provision ground that for me possibly circumvents um, the unevenness of the juridical domain, important though it was uh, for enslaved peoples in the Caribbean um, and to explore a concept I've termed eco-ontology. So eco-ontology minds the logics, the ethics and sensibilities of the plot, self-sufficiency, kinship ties, et cetera, to consider how enslaved peoples and their descendants reclaimed their subjectivity by cultivating the earth, often in ways that were more sustainable than the plantation's extractive imperatives. Um, scholars in Caribbean and post-colonial studies have variously theorized the plot as a site of resistance to the plantation through the reclamation of Black modern subjectivity within a zone of social death. 
in her important essay, novel and history, plot and plantation, Jamaican um, writer and cultural theorist, Sylvia Winter uh, establishes a bipartite schema between the colonial plantation and the slave garden plot, whereby the plot is figured as the focus of resistance to the market system and market values. Um, and the plantation represents the exploitative logics of the global uh, capitalist market economy. She writes, African peasants transplanted to the plot all the uh, structure of values that had been created by traditional societies of Africa, the land remained the earth. Around the growing of yam, a food for survival, he created on the plot a folk culture, the basis of a social order that recreated um, traditional values, use values as opposed to exchange values that became a source of cultural, cultural, um, <clears throat> cultural, guerrilla resistance uh, to the plantation system. In her unpublished manuscript, Black Metamorphosis, Winter tracks how the transplantation of West Africans to the so-called new world generated multiple transformations or metamorphoses. The multi-tribal African was converted into a Negro and a social cultural human being was metamorphosed into a commodity and large scale staple. Their labor became labor power and through the establishment of plantations, the earth, uh, and nature became land, reduced to their productivity and property relations. The enslaved African therefore developed a dual and ambivalent relationship with the new land, growing cane and cotton for his master's profit and yam for food. Winter uh, further captures this tension thusly. For the earth uh, in the new world form had herself become ambivalent. She was both the source of sustenance as a peasant plot and also the provider of alienated and alienating land for the plantation. What the black would contain from, would retain from Africa, what he transformed, what he recreated was determined by his attempt to survive in his struggle against the plantation system. While the official plantation ideology would develop as an idea of property and the, in the individual's right to property, that is as the right to own the property of black labor power, the provision ground ideology would remain based on man's uh, relation to the earth, uh, the base of his social being. In this way, the plot was crucial to the rerouting of the re of the uprooted, Winter argues, through the retention of traditional African knowledges, cultural and religious practices, and relations to the land. The ideology of the provision ground and the culture based on it, she argues, rehumanized the object property created by the plantation ideology. Um, and this, and this uh, notion of rehumanizing is crucial um, for my conceptualization of eco-ontology. Similarly, environmental historian Judith Carney has described uh, provision grounds as the botanical gardens of the dispossessed, the marginal, those who struggle to hold on to their cultural identity under dehumanized conditions. Literary scholar Simon Gakandi argues that in regard to, uh, to questions of land and emplacement, the provision ground helped restore a measure of autonomy to the African slave because it gave them a measure of control over time and space. It was at once a source of food, money, and pleasure. Similarly, for uh, Haitian anthropologist and theorist Michel Rolf Trouillot, uh, provision grounds can be read not only as material fields used to, to enhance slaves' physical and legal conditions, including at times the purchase of one's freedom, uh, they can also be read as symbolic fields for the production of individual selves by way of the production of material goods. So, so I thus conceive of the plantation as a black material, um, excuse me, I thus conceive of the plot as a black material, cultural, political, and especially ontological geography that enabled enslaved peoples and their descendants to feed themselves, retain and remake aspects of their West African religious and cultural traditions and engage in communal practices of care while also cultivating a sense of autonomy and individualism. These are the aspects of the plot that undergird my conceptualization of eco-ontology as a counter-hegemonic praxis of what literary scholar and cultural theorist Kevin Kwashi calls Black aliveness. So as I've argued, slave garden plots existed in varying degrees all over the global Black South and remain crucial to expressions and practices of Black subjectivity and self-determination well after emancipation. In post-emancipation Jamaica, the provision ground system persisted um, um, as an integral part of the peasant life world. Um, from this system of provision grounds and slave markets, the freed slaves moved naturally toward acquiring land and expanding their economic opportunities. 
So in the time that I have left, I want to shift our attention to the post-emancipation U.S. South, and particularly to the, to the Tuskegee Institute, the agricultural and industrial school founded by Booker T. Washington in 1881. In my forthcoming manuscript, I read Tuskegee as exemplifying this historical tension between the plot and the plantation within Black modernity as necessarily endowed with a plot logic and ethic through its commitment to black vitality and uplift as it continued to struggle within and against the plantation. Um, in my rereading of Tuskegee for its plot ethics, uh, logics and sensibilities, I considered the material, terrestrial and broader ecological arms of Booker T. Washington's uplift project, particularly his effort to plot an agrarian future in the rural Jim Crow South. Uh, the logic and practice of regenerating poor, depleted land and making it productive again, transforming an old, worn out plantation into a modern farm, those are, are Washington's words, is a central feature of his plot logic um, that most accounts of Tuskegee have failed to adequately engage. Washington used this logic of repurposing and regenerating to establish Tuskegee as a site for the production of modern Black subjectivity from the old Negro of slavery to a Southern new Negro. For Washington, the plantation turned modern farm could indeed be otherwise productive of Black futures. In place of the burned big house um, where, where Tuskegee was established on, on a former cotton plantation, he and his faculty and students erected a campus whose landscape and architecture um, countered the plantation's extractive and accumul accumulative logics. And um, this is the quote about him establishing it on the old plantation, but this is what Tuskegee originally was. Um, um, uh, there was a chicken coop and two slave cabins there, and this is what it became. Um, um, and th these images circulated uh, throughout uh, the, the institution's uh, literature. As director of Tuskegee's Department of Agriculture, George Washington Carver, the renowned agricultural scientist, played a crucial role in regenerating T Tuskegee's worn out lands after decades of degradation by the abusive cotton cultivation. In his recruitment letter to Carver, Washington writes, our students are poor, often starving. They travel miles of torn roads across years of poverty. We teach them to read and write, but words cannot fill stomachs. They need to learn how to plant and harvest crops. As a Tuskegee faculty member, Washington informed Carver uh, he would be faced with, quote, the challenge of bringing people from degradation, poverty, and waste to full manhood, end quote. Through Washington's and Carver's respective re regenerative projects, I propose eco-ontologies as a concept for grappling with how planting and harvesting crops was at Tuskegee inextricably intertwined with racial uplift and the journey from degradation, poverty, and waste to full manhood. Specifically, I ask, how did some of the very people most devastated by the plantation, whose coerced labor ironically contributed to the region's ecological degradation, imagine and participate in the regeneration of plantation lands alongside their own transformation from enslaved property to quasi-citizens and self-determined subjects in the New South? Indeed, the repurposed plantation is an eco-ontological strategy for the coterminous regeneration of Black life and the earth. Washington's autobiographical writings, Carver's agricultural bulletins, um, and Tuskegee's institutional literature articulate a vision for an eco-ontological and agrarian future for Black Southerners in the U.S. that was eventually expanded to include the broader global Black South. And in the book project, I demonstrate, I talk about the ways that Tuskegee, that the Tuskegee idea was taken up and adapted by um, um, Afro-descended peoples in Cuba and Jamaica and Haiti, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so um, throughout his oeuvre, um, Washington, uh, Washington reasoned that since 85% of the colored people in the Gulf states depended upon agriculture for their living, the school was determined not to educate our students out of sympathy with agricultural life. Well, um, instead, they were encouraged to bring teacher to become teachers who would quote, return to the plantation districts and show the people there how to put new energy and new ideas into farming. So throughout his oeuvre, Washington frequently lamented the problem of monocropping among poor black farmers and central Alabama's plantation districts. Despite the fact that the land all about the cabin homes, um, um, all about the cabin homes can produce every kind of garden vegetable that is raised anywhere in the country, he observes, Black farmers, one object seemed to be to plant nothing but cotton. 
And in many cases, cotton was planted up to the very door of the cabin, putting a stranglehold on rural domestic life. Uh, instead of growing co cotton for the market and foodstuff to sustain themselves, formerly enslaved peoples often purchased food from the local commissary, ensnaring themselves in perennial cycles of debt and economic dependence on the plantation commodity that exploited their labor and the land around them. Uh, as cotton still reigned supreme in the U.S. South at the turn of the, of the century, Tuskegee aimed to teach farmers how to grow it more efficiently while encouraging them to grow food for their own subsistence as well. Um, we cannot quit cotton, Washington wrote in Working with the Hands, but we must raise our stock and our meat too. In this way, he attempted to mobilize the plot to intervene in the South's plantation economy and its racial capitalist underpinnings. Uh, Tuskegee's agricultural program uh, modeled the very plot logic um, that Washington advocated for poor rural farmers. So um, those students cultivated cotton, 135 acres of the main campus and 350 acres of the, of the campus farm were used to produce the vast amounts of farm and garden products consumed by the institution. Upon purchasing the property, Washington acknowledged, quote, our land is not the regular cotton land, though it will grow cotton, but I am satisfied that that will not be the most profitable thing to cultivate. The regular cotton that is low, um, the regular cotton land is low and swampy. Our land will produce all the common vegetables and especially sweet potatoes. Such things will pay us well. We can sell what we do not consume. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this was the model of semi-large scale subsistence um, uh, uh, farming that Tuskegee sought to encourage among its students as well as rural black folk in the plantation districts primarily growing for uh, food for their own consumption and then growing cotton and other vegetables for sale on the market. Um, Tuskegee's plot logic thus consisted of making the former Bowen plantation an originary geography of degraded black ontology or more precisely that degraded black ontology, otherwise productive and a site of rehumanization as Winter might, might put it. So, such a claim does not overlook the very real limitations of Washington's political project. And how, he, and how its hegemony constrained certain forms of Black political progress. However, slave garden plots were similarly paradoxical geographies that had an unintended benefit to the planter class uh, by fueling Black bodies to continue their labor for the market economy. Even the Maroons, the paragons of Black resistance to slavery, forged treaties with colonial governments wherein they agreed to return fugitive slaves to the plantation to maintain their own precarious freedom. Thus, a plot logic is always already entangled with the plantation and sometimes uh, uh, um, uh, unintentionally reinscribes right certain certain violences of the of the plantation as well. So so I read Tuskegee for those moments, practices, and logics of straining against extraction and depletion of the plantation and redirect our attention toward its efforts at regenerating, sustaining, and advancing Black life. Um, so. Tuskegee's agricultural extension work and efforts to aid Black farmers through the Negro Farmers Conferences um, are especially indicative of its plot logics, ethics, and sensibilities. I would even go so far as to say that it invites a reconsideration of Tuskegee as an early model of Black studies. Extension work was a part of the school's mission to translate and disseminate knowledge and resources among rural, the rural Black masses who were unable to attend Tuskegee or to pursue a traditional or formal education. Beginning in 1892, Tuskegee hosted the annual Farmers Conference, which brought thousands of Black farmers to campus annually to share up-to-date knowledge on scientific agriculture and provided a forum to share their, uh, their successes in farming as well. In 1897, the state of Alabama passed legislation uh, that provided $1,500 to establish an agricultural experiment station at Tuskegee. For several years, the school reprinted the uh, legislation in its annual catalog. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, in its annual catalog, one of its most important literary documents that circulated to students and parents in the Caribbean and Africa and helped to recruit them to the, to the institution. Uh, an example of, of legal culture, perhaps. I was wondering, like, why do they keep reprinting this, this, um, uh, this, this act by the Alabama legislature in the, in, the, in the annual catalog? Also known as the school's experiment plot, it was renowned agricultural scientist George Washington Carver's laboratory for studying soil regeneration and sustainable cultivation methods to counter the abusive and extractive practices introduced by the plantation regime. Um, according to Carney, the widespread presence of gardens and plantation economies uh, reveals a parallel universe of crop experimentation, 
seed exchanges and dietary practices that contributed to the maintenance of African foodways among black, black peoples forced into bondage in the Americas. So, so Tuskegee's experiment plot is a post-emancipation iteration of the slave garden plot for it was used for just such purposes. Uh, Carver used the agricultural experiment station to crossbreed new, new varieties of cotton that were better suited for um, Alabama soils and published and circulated bulletins for Alabama farmers on how to build up and regenerate worn out soils. He made sure to write the bulletins in language that was accessible to lay farmers and encouraged them to use natural fertilizers that were affordable, readily available and ecologically sustainable. Importantly, he also conducted numerous experiments on foods that grew well in Southern soils and shared recipes developed by Tuskegee students. Furthermore, to encourage crop diversification among attendees at the farmers conferences, Tuskegee uh, provided all kinds of garden seeds free of charge uh, to those who could not afford to buy seeds on their own and included visual diagrams such as this one um, in their institutional literature teaching farmers how to lay out a 40 acre farm and rotate crops. And this, this is actually drawn by George Washington Carver and we can, we can talk about it um, uh, in Q&A. Um, so, so in conclusion, with regards to the law, Tuskegee used the experiment plot and the resources that it afforded to help poor farmers circumvent the crop lean system and thus becoming ensnared in perennial cycles of debt. Um, the purpose most eagerly sought by the Agricultural Department of the Tuskegee Institute, Washington writes, is to demonstrate to the farmers of Alabama, first of all, that with right methods, their, their acres can be made to yield unfailing profit and that they can win in the fight against the deadly mortgage system. Uh, at the farmers' conferences, attendees adopted a declaration of principles that included a commitment uh, to abolish and do away with the mortgage system just as rapidly as possible, to raise our food supplies at home rather than to go into debt for them at the store, and to try to buy homes uh, to urge um, upon all Negroes the necessity of owning homes and farms, and not only to own them, but to beautify and to improve them. So, right, um, we can think about the the... Uh, imperative uh, for property ownership um, in this context. So, so in short, through the experiment plot, Tuskegee invested in making scientific agricultural knowledge and resources more equitable and readily available for the masses of Black folk who either could not or chose not to pursue a formal education. In their critique of the uh, plantational scene discourse for its initial failure to take up racialization and offering a flattened multi-species argument, um, Alex um, Moulton et al argued that the plot provides a vision of making kin as an ethical political project, one where intimately sharing oneself with others has enormous creative potential for the cultivation of new forms of cooperation necessary for a just and sustainable future. Tuskegee's extension work, its effort to make agricultural knowledge is more accessible for rural black folk, indeed reflects such a plot logic and sensibility and, and, and elucidates how the plot remained crucial to the Black freedom struggle in the post-emancipation period as well. Thank you.
fitting transition, I hope. Um, so, you know, uh, the talk is about Mohsen Hamid's uh, third novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. Um, and in it, he explores sort of the idea of, of um, you know, the human kind of um, at large, the, the category of the youth. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and um, about the question of sort of human rights um, with all caveats, you know, <laughs> in mind. Um, so Mohsen Hamid's third novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, is part building to Ramon, telling a rags to riches story in which the protagonist rises from rural poverty to successful, if ethically bereft, entrepreneurship in an unnamed, sprawling Asian megacity. Yet it is also part self-help manual, laying out the surefire steps by which to get filthy rich by obtaining capital, both cultural and material. The central gimmick of the book then is that the protagonist whose development we witness is you. So the novel is written in the second person and you are the main character in it. Um, so, you know, again, and I, I call it a gimmick because I think that it is in fact a gimmick. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, this sort of gap between the reader and the, the object of the novel is sort of, you know, erased, right? Um, and you become the pro pro protagonist. Um, all right, so written in the second person narrative voice with chapters titled, move to the city, get an education, work for yourself, or learn from a master, to more cautionary strategies like avoid idealists, befriend a bureaucrat, and don't fall in love, each segment propels you, the reader, along a me meteoric rise to social prominence and material wealth. The novel opens with the protagonist whose childhood illness prompts the family to move to the city on the brink of migration away from extended family and rural feudalism toward the modern atomized family, what Hamid playfully terms, the ongoing proliferation of the nuclear. The protagonist embarks on his path to becoming rich by among other things, repackaging and selling tap water as bottled water. Over the course of the novel, your commercial ventures become both increasingly lucrative and increasingly illegal. <coughs> um, also ethically spurious. <laughs> uh, the novel closes with the protagonist's downfall and eventual death as he reflects on the tumultuous and extraordinary path his life has taken. Your life has taken. <laughs> the fact that you build your future by illegally trafficking in bottled water becomes particularly meaningful when viewed through the lens of colonial water legislation and its post-colonial aftermath on the subcontinent. The forms of subjectivity fostered through the 19th century colonial regulation of water use and access give rise to a particular vision of what constitutes criminality on the one hand and human rights on the other. So this sort of um, oscillation in the novel between sort of um, invoking the post-colonial subject as criminal on the one hand and as human on the other hand, right, is what I'm particularly interested in today. The you of how to get filthy rich can thus be read as a legacy of colonial laws and the subjectivities they engendered. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in how the law makes certain subjectivities possible, obviously, and uh, the ways in which those subjectivities are produced out of a particular history. Um, at the same time, I'm mindful of the limitations of reading the present exclusively as a product of the past. To this end, in our conversations, I would like to explore more optimistic or perhaps pessimistic um, imaginations for the future that aim to shape legislative interventions um, in the present in order to foster equitable access to water and enable more capacious understandings of the human and right. Uh, as many critics have noted, the novel clearly takes aim at the forms of subjectivity that it suggests neoliberal capitalism produces. Success within this framework, Hamid implies, necessitates corruption and violence. Uh, so then the, um, the protagonist goes through a series of kind of illegal um, activities in order to sort of stage this, you know, ascent in wealth. Uh, the novel thus satirizes, uh, sorry, success within the, this framework, Hamid implies necessitates corruption and violence. Uh, the novel thus satirizes the length you must go to in order to get filthy rich. 
Um, the object of the novel satire, Angela Poon observes, is the capitalist neoliberal uh, notion of the self that is predicated on an overweening sense of control and ultimate agency. Within this model, the protagonist's criminality is a byproduct of an unchecked desire for wealth. As Poon notes, Hamid's choice of water as the commodity with which the protagonist makes his money is not accidental. As a scarce and precious commodity, the provision of which the state is content to outsource to third party private companies, water also stands as a potent symbolic reminder of market based policies and neoliberal ideologies breach. Okay. Um, at the same time, the relationship between water, criminality, and colonial subjectivity arises from a specific legal historical context. Layering onto this the history of colonial law, we see that both the criminality and the water access issues that are central to Hamid's story are part of a series of 19th century legal maneuvers that progressively work to cast the colonial subject under both the East India Company and the Crown as A, suspect of a racialized form of criminality, and B, um, indebted to the colonial state for water access. Um, so, you know, this kind of framing of water as both a commodity that can be trafficked in illegally on the one hand, and also as a kind of um, property of the colonial state, right? is again, something that um, I'm interested in and I'll kind of develop that relationship um, between water and property over the course of the paper. The paradigmatic example of criminality on the subcontinent is the figure of the thug. In the 1830s, W.H. Sleeman, an administrator with the East India Company began a campaign to suppress a form of hereditary criminality that he termed thuggy. So W.H. Sleeman, as many, many of you probably know, was uh, you know, a colonial administrator who sort of devised um, the, the category of the thug. Um, he identified a group of hereditary criminals, uh, ritual stranglers, uh, he, he um, recognized them to be, who were motivated by sort of um, you know, devotion to the goddess Kali. Uh, interestingly, they were drawn from both Hindu and Muslim. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in visuals, and uh, there was this sort of widespread campaign to suppress this form of uh, ritual strangulation and hereditary criminality. And uh, certain uh, tribes were identified as participating in this uh, cult of thuggy. And, um, you know, again, there was this, this sort of effort to, to suppress it. It became the sort of um, motivation to do away with uh, the sort of normal rules of criminal procedure. Anybody could be apprehended on the basis of a witness's uh, testimony and then convicted um, and sent to one of the penal colonies, for example, in the, um, you know, um, Southeast Asia or in, later in the Andaman Islands. Uh, it was an interesting uh, phenomenon as well because it happened to coincide with the beginnings of the nationalist movement and often it was uh, political dissidents who were rounded up and, and sort of um, deemed thugs and, and ship, shipped off. Um, so I'm, ta I'm taking that sort of um, idea of criminality as this sort of uh, model for colonial subjectivity, right, um, that we see originating in, in the, um, the paradigm of the thug. Uh, all right, so the suppression of thuggy acts of the 1830s and 40s granted vast powers to the colonial police and provided for the emergency suspension of rules of criminal procedure for the purposes of capturing and punishing thugs. Like the unsettled identity of Hamid's second person narration, Sleeman's characteri characterization of thugs was infinitely open. A thug could be anywhere, anywhere at any time. This is a, a quote from uh, Sleeman's text, right? Um, to men who do not know them, Sleeman writes in the Ramasiana, his massive um, encyclopedia of thug terminology, which also happens to just really be a dictionary of various <laughs> subcontinental <laughs> languages. Um, so, you know, in, in, he defines the thug, right? So he says, a thug, quote, will appear to be among the most amiable, most respectable, and most intelligent members of the lower and sometimes the middle and higher classes of native society. <laughs> So it could be anyone, right? <laughs> um, 
In short, the thug occupies the same empty and infinitely substitutable subjectivity as Hamid's construction of you. And it is not incidental, I believe, that criminality is central to the formation of Hamid's protagonist as well. If criminality is a defining feature of South Asian colonial subjectivity in Sleeman's 19th century account, Hamid's farcical portrait refashions criminality as an essential quality for post-colonial success. If how to get filthy rich in rising Asia is a spoof of post-colonial subjectivity, my focus here is on how the novel satirizes the emergence of the legal subject through the lens of colonial criminality. Though it takes the form of satire, Hamid's protagonist, like Sleeman's thug, seemingly inevitably becomes a criminal as he develops into an autonomous <coughs> subject. Within this logic, sub logic uh, subjectivity unfolds as criminality. While Hamid's novel is overtly satirical, it confirms many of the assumptions of racialized criminality that Sleeman's text set out to prove. Within the logic of the novel, it is impossible to separate the protagonist's experience of water insecurity from the global geopolitics of race and criminality. In the colonial era, legal subjectivity was produced through criminal policing and the penal code, but also through acts of legislation that structured relations between individuals, communities, and the state. For example, 19th century legislation over water use and access came to define the resource as an individual property right allocated by the state, as opposed to a communal right shared by individuals within a village or district. Reflecting on the effects of the Canal and Drainage Act of 1873 on access to water in contemporary Pakistan, Danish Mus Musafa observes that the legislation was less concerned with the, quote, provision of a public service to the people than it was with the consolidation and rationalization of colonial control over India by creating specific geographies of access to resources and social control. So uh, this kind of way in which water access was managed as a resource, right, in order to mediate social relations is something that um, I want to highlight here. In the colonial era, water was allocated within hierarchical systems of classification based on the perceived industriousness, loyalty to the Raj, and martial characteristics of different tribes and ethnicities in South Asia in general and in the Indus Basin in particular, Safa argues. Following David Gil Martin, Musafa further frames the Pakistani uh, state's policies as a continuation of the British colonial legacy insofar as the contemporary state is the inheritor of the Canal and Drainage Act imagination of legal geography. Likewise, Rohan D'Souza describes how colonial hydrology, which he defines as the varied hydraulic interventions of colonialism, came to, quote, simultaneously alter uh, South Asia's fluvial and social world. So again, bringing this sort of uh, idea of water into conversation with the idea of sociality and, and social hierarchies and so forth. The colonial administration's connection between access to water and social life, in which both the novel and entrenched hierarchy, in which both novel and entrenched hierarchies were instituted and maintained, especially when taken within the context of the racialized criminality of the thug campaign, forms the legal and historical backdrop of Hamid's text. And as Aditya Ramesh notes, uh, from the 1850s onward, uh, there was a concerted effort across British India to try to codify water laws to make water taxable. Um, so again, staging water as a commodity. Um, and, and I wanted to think about the colonial state's inauguration of water as a commodity in relationship to Hamid's then trafficking in sort of illegally bottled water. Over the course of the 19th century, um, various colonial laws, including the Madras uh, Irrigation Cess Act of 1865, the Canal and Drainage Act of 1873, and the Indian Easements Act of 1892, increasingly moved water access away from communal use or human rights in order to prioritize government control, the individual rights of property owners and commercial use. Um, importantly, colonial era water legislation, controlling access for both irrigation and drinking has remained largely, largely unchanged across the subcontinent. So 
uh, contemporary water laws really do follow uh, the same colonial uh, patterns that were inaugurated during the 19th century. So really uh, not much has changed. Um, if we read How to Get Filthy Rich with this legal history in mind, we can see the protagonist's efforts to embark on his self-help journey with a fake bottled water business as a consequence of hierarchizing and commercializing water access. The legal history of the subcontinent that exacerbates contemporary problems of water scarcity also presumes a default criminality for those subject to the law. At the same time, your bottled water business is set against the backdrop of the very real challenges of providing water security to the mega cities of rising Asia. As I've argued elsewhere in a different context, as access to resources such as water was becoming increasingly egalitarian in Britain and other colonial metropoles, it was simultaneously becoming more hierarchized and controlled in the colonies. Framing water as property, which can then be stolen and sold on the black market, is a condition through which you not only emerge as a criminal, but also get filthy rich. This is particularly ironic given that the conversion of water into property occurred at the same historical moment at which Governor General Dalhousie instituted his infamous doctrine of lapse, with which granted the colonial government enormous powers to annex land that was governed by a sovereign who died without a biological heir. So this normativization of hereditary property um, becomes the kind of mechanism through which property can be annexed by the, the colonial government. Um, and that annexation, uh, or you know, one could say theft, right, of the land becomes the precondition um, for us to imagine the theft of water that runs through that land. Uh, in short, uh, territorial annexation was made nominally legal through Dalhousie's doctrine, while, while free use of water became illegal through a network of acts passed to link access to government regulation and private property rights. The colonial seizure of land thus becomes the basis for your criminal theft of water. Uh, to be clear, my argument is not that Hamid had this legal history in mind when he wrote his novel, or even that he was aware of it necessarily. I'm not suggesting a direct influence of the law on how to get filthy rich in rising Asia or on the characters within the novel. What I am arguing um, instead is that this colonial legal history has a profound effect on the kinds of subjectivities that can arise and the ways in which they can be imagined, including by Hamid, right? So how does the law frame what we're capable of imagining? Imagining how do subjectivities arise out of the kind of social productions of the law? Um, in this regard, I read the form of subjectivity imagined within Hamid's novel as a symptom of the laws governing water access and criminality, rather than a commentary on them. What How to Get Filthy Rich diagnoses is a uniquely post-colonial framing of the problem of human rights at odds with property rights that persist into the present moment. In the post-colonial moment, what we see playing out on the subcontinent is the conversion of human rights into rights of citizenship. Throughout, throughout South Asia's long pre-colonial history, water, water was considered a human right under both Hindu and Islamic law. In the colonial era, as I have discussed, this right was allocated to the government and private landowners. In the post-colonial moment, this framework has largely remained intact. In what has come to be known as the Coca-Cola case of 2002, uh, protesters claimed that the Coca-Cola uh, bottling factory in uh, Plachamata, Kerala, was polluting local groundwater and demanded the factory's closure. Studies confirmed that the water was unfit for drinking, uh, domestic use, or irrigation. And by environmentalists and activists issued the Plachamata Declaration stating that water is not a private property, not a commodity, uh, but a common resource and a fundamental right. When the case came before the Kerala High Court, the judge decided that quote, uh, groundwater should be considered as a public trust. Uh, yet on appeal, a two-judge bench of the same court reversed the ruling and affirmed the right for water extraction based on land ownership. So this idea of, you know, linking water use to land ownership, right, um, that was set in motion during the colonial era, again, remains in force uh, in the contemporary moment as well. Uh, 
The problem of groundwater is particularly pressing in India, where it comprises 80% of drinking water. In his discussion of groundwater law in India, uh, Philippe Poulet cites the humanitarian and scientific rationales for amending the legal regulation of groundwater. As the science of aquifers becomes clearer, the need to distinguish between surface land and groundwater becomes more evident. <coughs> so during the colonial era, surface water and groundwater essentially followed the same um, laws, right? That uh, access to the water was determined by land ownership on the surface of the land. Uh, you know, more recently, science has kind of uh, modified the, this proposition uh, by recognizing that the aquifers extend beyond sort of property lines, right? And so how do you regulate um, groundwater um, according to this sort of uh, idea of private property? Uh, there is little justification for linking water access to private property when groundwater arises from aquifers that do not follow surface level property lines. This is especially salient, Coulet argues, given the human right to water. One solution that Coulet proposes is to hold groundwater in a public trust. Coulet seems, sees promise in the, in the uh, public trust doctrine because it is, quote, based on the idea that certain interests are so intrinsically important to every citizen that their free availability tends to mark the society as one of citizens rather than serfs. So going back to the, the question of the feudal, right? Um, yet to what extent is the citizen a viable substitute for the human? What happens when the rights of citizens are conflated with the rights of the human? If one of the qualities attached to the infinite substitutability of Hamid's you is criminality, as I discussed above, another is humanity. Your fake water bottled water business is set against the backdrop of the very real challenges again of providing um, water security to the megacities of rising Asia. Um, according to the World Health Organization, 1.8 million people die every year from diarrheal diseases, including um, you know, obviously waterborne uh, illnesses, 90% are children under five, uh, mostly in, uh, you know, developing countries. Um, so 80, um, yeah, so more generally, you are just one individual in the vast and growing population of the urban global south. Setting the novel in rising Asia refuses the specificity of nationality and citizenship because your citizenship remains undisclosed, your only claim is to the category of the human. Yet if rising Asia is immediately unrecognizable, its vision of deterritorialization de is also mythic. The material history of the post-partition subcontinent has persistently reflected an incapacity to imagine human rights detached from citizens' rights. On the one hand, dams, irrigation canals, and mechanized groundwater pumping are hall hallmarks of post-colonial infrastructure projects aimed at improving communal access to water and thus extending human rights to the broader population. On the other hand, such projects often replicate the problems of pri uh, privatizing water access, for example, when enhancing the water rights of Indian citizens has the corresponding effect of cutting off water supplies to Pakistan. The Indus Water Treaty of um, 1960 exemplifies this problem. Negotiated through the auspices of the World Bank, the treaty divided the rivers of Northern uh, South Asia, allocating three Eastern rivers to India and three Western rivers to Pakistan. The treaty has remained uh, in force since its inception, but has generated almost constant conflict. India's construction of a hydroelectric, hydroelectric uh, power plant on a tributary, tributary to a Western river, for example, threatens pa Pakistan's access to its rights of usage. One country's use of water creates a lack of access to the other. So how can we think of use and access together instead of at odds with one another? Is it possible to do so while still working within the framework of the nation state? Can the human exist alongside the citizen? How to get filthy rich in rising Asia seems to offer a partial answer. By refusing the possibility of a singular location, the novel seems to invoke a more expansive notion of subjectivity, one more commensurate with the figure of the human. Moreover, it seems to be localized in, in Asia, or at least uh, in the global south. 
Yet despite the novel's attempts to balance the universalist aims of human rights with the political realities of rising Asia, the novel is focalized through a, a colonial perspective. Although it is presented as a satire, the novel both confirms the suspicions of its protagonist's criminality and affirms the desires of the liberal subject. At the end of the novel, you becomes indistinguishable from me, um, as the narrative coerces the reader into rooting for and identifying with all of the protagonist's most normative desires. The conceit of the self-help book ultimately follows the most predictable Bildungsroman plotline, channeling our shared goals into financial success and heterosexual romance, essentially offering Jane Eyre as the paradigmatic figure of the human. <laughs> Returning to where I began, the question I would like to close with is, can we imagine a more expansive way of conceptualizing the human as a subject of rights, or do the particularities of both the law and literary genre invariably route the subject toward their own normative goals? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so with lunch in hand as we continue eating, um, <laughs> thank you all for your, your patience and flexibility. Um, we have the great pleasure of Luis E. Carcamo Huachante, a Mapuche scholar and director of the program in Native American and Indigenous Studies and Associate Professor of Spanish at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a founding member of the Comunidad de Historia Mapuche, a collective of Mapuche researchers and activists based in southern Chile. Luis has just completed a book manuscript, Mapuche Interferences, Acoustic Colonialism and in Indigenous Response, that analyzes literary texts, radio shows, and music to discuss questions of indigeneity, language, and sound in relation to what he calls acoustic <coughs> colonialism. As a respondent, we have the great pleasure of Jimena Briseño, a lecturer of Latin American Literatures and Cultures at Stanford University. Her teaching and research areas include Andean and Latin American literature and film, animality theories, and cultural consumption. Her latest book, Visiones de los Andes, Ensayos Críticos sobre el Concepto de Paisaje y Región, co with Jorge Coronado, brings together cross-disciplinary studies of land. My name is Luis Carcamo Bosante. I'm a Mapuche scholar and person. It is a true honor to be here. I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, uh, to, I mean, I would like to recognize all the uh, American Indian and indigenous peoples who have been part of, or who have become part of the history of these ancestral lands, particularly the Olone tribe here in what is today known as Northern California. Uh, for the invitation, uh, also my gratitude uh, towards uh, my colleague, Hector Hoyos, uh, and also the work uh, of uh, Joe uh, for helping me to get here. Uh, so thank you very much. Mapu is a concept that is critical to the Mapuche people. Mapu means land, territory, universe, and it, it encompasses the tangible and non-tangible realm of earthly life. We, the Che people, persons, do not own the Mapu. We belong to it. 
Mapuche, people of the land, of the earth, of the universe. Mm. Therefore, the call of the Mapu is always omnipresent in all terrains of Mapuche life quest. To take care of it in the past and in the present day, an important number of Mapuche communities resist the Chilean and Argentine settler, settler nation states that continue deploying its colonizing forces upon the Mapu. This sense of Mapu-based engagement is what has led Mapuche historians, writers, and communities to articulate forms of language, self-representation, and action that embody a poetics and politics of native land restitution and autonomy from the jurisdiction of colonizing state geopolitics. In this talk, I will focus on what I characterize as material and symbolic exercises of indigenous autonomy in the context of the struggles of the Mapuche literary, intellectual, and political movement in recent decades in what is today known, in what is known today as quote unquote Chile. From this angle, my presentation aims to highlight non-textual and textual acts such as Mapuche historiographical scholarship, mm -hmm. literary works, and political mobilizations as instances that embrace the Mapu as a linguistic, geographical, and political, political jurisdictions that challenges the dominance of settler state formations. Mapu. In 1989, Mapuche author Leonel Enla published his first book of poetry under the title Se ha despertado el ave de mi corazón. The birth of my heart has awakened. A book that marks a pivotal moment in print culture history in Chile as a first literary work that uses Mapuzungun, the Mapuche language, as the primary language of this collection of poems. The last book opens with a poem in which the figure of the Mapu plays a cardinal role, symbolically and graphically. Here, the last verses. Mapu ni peuma, wirek mekei, ni peukimeu, el sueño de la tierra, grita, in my corazón. The dream of the land shouts in my heart. <coughs> As made evident by the quoted verses, the Mapu is at the center of the Enlaf's poem, in, of the Enlaf's poetics. In his verses, the land, the land shouts and dreams. It is a shout and dream that comes from the very heart of the poem, the poem's speaker. The Mapu becomes a dreaming and a speaking persona. The land dreams and sounds as an active agent. The shout of the land, represented in the uppercase type, brings both strength and tension to this bilingual, brief, compressed text that remains unfinished in the Spanish version. Indeed, the ellipses perhaps mark the incompleteness of the Mapuche expression in the colonial language, namely Spanish. In this poem, the native language is elevated to a primary position, which is made graphically evident on the page. Indeed, placing Mapuzungun the, Mapu, the text in Mapuzungun in capital letters above the Spanish version visualizes a linguistic politics that shapes the entire book of Yenla. Furthermore, the visual preeminence of Mapuzungun enables Yenla to place Mapu as the first word in the poem. Mapu and Mapuzungun become inaugural and foundational in the launching of the poetics of Se ha despertado el ave de mi corazón. It is important to highlight that Mapuzungun already embodies a constitutive, a constitutive link to the land. 
as a composite term, it brings together the Mapu and Fingun, language, sense, sound, voice. That's what Fingun means. Mapu Fingun can be defined as a language of the land, as a language of the territory, or as a language of the earth or universe. In this non-anthropocentric sense, the trope of the land lays at the very basis of Mapuzungun, which is graphically visualized in the very territory of the page in the last poem. <clears throat> Mapu emerges as a living being at the very heart of the poetic persona, resonating as the shout of Mapuche political struggles for the land particularly given how the publication of the last first book coincided with an increasingly massive movement for democracy and the terminal phase of the right-wing civic military dictatorship led by General Augusto Pinochet in the Chile of the late 1980s. For the Mapuche, Pinochet's dictatorship was not only challenging for the Mapuche, the Pinochet dictatorship was not only a challenge, but also the very quote unquote democratic transition in Chile as a political process carried out within the framework of a neoliberal capitalist model, which had severely affected the status of native lands throughout the Mapuche territory. <coughs> the Chilean democratic transition resulted indeed from negotiations between military commanders, the entrepreneurial class, and the political elites that were invested in the continuity of the, of the market-oriented capitalist model inherited from Pinochet's years. Many Mapuche communities began to reveal their political and social organizations while denouncing the alliance of the Chilean state with private corporations that promoted and financed the expansion of one particular industry over the Mapuche territory, the forestry industry. As a book of poetry published in 1989, Lien Lap Se Ha Despertado El Ave de Mi Corazón was immediately recognized as an intrinsic part of this historical moment, as a shout or, valile, or, or a voice of Mapuche resurgence and the struggle for na the native land, that is the Mapu. In Lienlaf's poetry, the land is more than an externality, symbolically and sonorously. Lienlaf expresses how it is internalized in language and subjectivity. The dream of the land shouts in my heart. World map. Beginning in the late 20th century, Mapuche organizations and movement leaders reclaim the Mapuche, the whole Mapuche territory again as World Map under the name World Map. A land that used to be free and borderless prior to the establishment of the settler nation states. In this case, the Argentine and Chilean states. <clears throat> as, in this way, land politics emerged as a critical component of the Mapuche movement in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The sense of territorial articulation is confirmed in the very name of one of the most influential Mapuche political organizations that was founded in the city of Temuco at this time, Okini Wolmapu Gulam, Council of All Lands. Started in 1989 with a focus on politics of self-determination and autonomy, this organization, the Council of All Lands, Okini Wolmapu Gulam, openly challenged the colonial framework of the Chilean nation state by waving the flag of Wolmapu that is all Mapuche lands, a geopolitical space that traverses the Argentina-Chile border. 
Mapuche historian Paulo Marimán Quemenado contributed, contributed to a work of fundamental importance for the indigenous researchers in Chile uh, that was entitled Escucha Huinca. Claims, he claims, Paulo Marimán, that prior to the settlement of the nation states, uh, the, the territories used to go, uh, the Mapuche territory used to be a borderless space. This region, Paulo Marimán says, was never Chilean or Argentine. We call it the Walmapu, the Mapuche country, Walmapu. Similarly, historian and activist Jose Miguel Payal argues in this book, Escucha Huinca, which was published in 2006 in Chile, Miguel Payal argues that the Mapuche inhabited a vast territory prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. Miguel Payal says, it is well known that from the early 16th century, the groups that make up the Mapuche culture had settled, settled in the past territorial space that extends from the Limari River in the north to the large island of Chilwe, Chiloe, in the south, from the west of the Andes and the eastern slopes of the, of the mountains to the northern and central areas of the Neuquén province in what is today Argentina, and also to the south of the current province of Mendoza, Argentina. In this sense, the Mapuche consider the regions of the western slope toward the Pacific Ocean, that is the regions eventually claimed by the Chilean nation state, to form part of what we call Gulumap, Gulumap, lands of the west. They refer to the lands from the eastern slope at the same time, the Mapuche refer to the lands from the eastern slope of the Andes to the Atlantic Ocean eh, as Puelmapu, lands of the east. 16th century Spanish colonial agents endeav endeavored to discover, conquer, and populate these Mapuche territories. Between 1535 and 1537, the conquistador Diego de Almagro began this project in earnest, although it was not until 1540, with the more aggressive invasion carried out by the conquistador Pedro de Valdivia, that the Spaniards attempted to incorporate the Mapuche territory into their newly established, quote unquote, Kingdom of Chile. When the Republic of Chile was founded in 1810 by the Creole elite, Gulumapu was still widely controlled by the Mapuche people particularly between the Bio Bio River and the Tolpen River. This posed a challenge for the geopolitical rule of the newly former, formed Chilean settler state, which had to plot its colonial agenda from then on. In line, with, in line with the long history of Mapuche territorial resistance and the stance of the more recent Mapuche movement that emerged in the late 1980s, the authors of the book Escucha Huinca consider the concept of Walmapu to be a vindication of the ancestral Mapuche territory. In Mapuzengun, the term Walmapu is related to the concept of the universe in general. However, in the late 20th century, Mapuche leaders and organizations began using it to refer to the all the Mapuche lands or the Mapuche country, a resignification of the term Bolmapu that has, has become part of the, the battle, of our battle, to reclaim the names and representations of an ancestral territory that has been subsumed by the denominations, quote unquote, Chile and Argentina. As an act of territorial reclamation, historian. Paulo Marimán, then in, on, on, the, on the referred book, Escucha Ingua, Winca, insert his own drawing of Walmapu in the opening chapter, representing this territory graphically and figuratively. So this is the, the map of Walmapu that 
eh, historian, Mapuche historian Pablo Marimán draw as part of the opening chapter of this 2006 book, Escucha Huinca. Escucha Huinca became the first eh, book fully co-authored by eh, Mapuche historians. It has uh, four chapters. Uh, each his, uh, Mapuche historian takes care of uh, one uh, uh, historical period uh, since the 16th century onward. And Paulo Mariman Quemenado uh, is the author of one of the uh, opening chapters in the book. So at the time, there was no available mapping of what uh, uh, the Mapuche, Mapuche activists and organization already were invoking as Walmapu, all the Mapuche lands. So prior to 2006, no book on the history and geography of modern South America had ever included such a representation because all Argentine and Chilean cartography auto automatically superimposed the geopolitical borders of the Creole nation states onto Walmapu. In his remapping or countermapping, Paulo Mariman reverts to an older version of map making to depict the geography of Walmapu. Relying upon archival sources, Mariman, Mariman sets out to, in his own words, to capture that message of antiquity expressed by a pre-1800 maps and represent figures that were much more concrete than abstracts, okay? So this is a very interesting move because he draws this kind of Mapuche way to represent the uh, old ancestral lands of the Mapuche people without uh, the nation state borders, uh, but then he incorporates a lot of uh, 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 the, the sort of a graphic lexicon of those maps that were common even uh, in kind of Western cartographic culture prior to the 1800s. So it's a way to, uh, to, to, to be in a sort of a temporality and a visuality prior to the nation state formation. Okay, so that's a kind of anti colonial move. The Mapuche historian, Pablo Mariman, in this way returns to a figurative style of cartographic representation prevalent prior to the 1800s. And, the, and uh, uh, getting away for, from the most abstract geometry, the sort of Cartesian geo, ge, geometry of the modern maps of colonizing nation states. An act of Kisu Gunegun. In April of 2007, the Chilean government proceeded to plan the implementation of the national census that had to take place by that year, according to the Chilean state agenda. The national census was planned to cover all the territory, including Mapuche lands subject to the geopolitical jurisdiction of the Republic of Chile. However, on April 14th of that year, representatives of the Mapuche Temuicui community announced that they were not going to participate in the census. And subsequently, they would not allow the census takers sent by the Chilean state to enter the territory of the community. Jorge Huenchuyan, the main spokesperson of the Temucuicui community, stated the following. Nosotros no dependemos del Estado. No vamos a caer en su juego. Nos interesa que nos devuelvan las tierras, que se vayan las forestales y una nación mapuche libre. Esa es la política de nuestra comunidad. So you have the, uh, my own free translation of this uh, quote in English there. Because of this historic decision, on April 19th, 2007, the day planned for the national census to happen, 
the Temu Kulkul community block the census takers from accessing their autonomous, autonomous Mapuche territory. As reflected in the, as reflected in the words of a, a spokesperson, Jorge Huanchuyan, this quote unquote refusal was a way to was a way to protest the very jurisdiction of a Chilean nation state that had expanded the forestry industry over native lands in recent decades. It is well known that since the, since the period of Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship and through the post 1990 period of quote unquote democratic governments, the massive and indiscriminate plantation of radiata pine and eucalyptus trees by private companies has exponentially expanded, taking over ancestral and historic Mapuche territories, including the whole area that surrounds the Temukuikui community. This settled corporate post forestry business has developed under the multiple juridical arrangements sponsored by the Chilean state to incentivize private investments in it. Mainly exported to China, Europe, the United States, and Canada, this in industry has deployed throughout the Bio Bio, Araucania, rivers, and lakes regions of what is today known as Southern Chile, that is a core region of Walmapu. As recent studies have pointed out, the major economic benefits from this mega forestation business on indigenous territories goes almost exclusively to a group of elite, elite Chilean entrepreneurs, which occurs at the expense of the life condition of Mapuche communities, and much more deeply speaking, at the cost of the Mapu. The effects of this invasive industry, which has enjoyed the protection of the Chilean colonial and capitalist legal framework, is what Mapuche and Chilean scholars Hector Nahuelpan, Edgar Martinez, Álvaro Hofflinger, and Paulo Villalén describe in a, two, in a 2021 article in the following terms. So I read the translation of this quote into English and you can read in Spanish uh, there if uh, you wish. So now Pan et al say, all this has been reflected in loss of biodiversity, destruction of the native forest, decrease and pollution of water flows, increase in the use of pesticides, deterioration of public infrastructure, rise of inequality and poverty rates, diversification in the forms of racial exploitation of native labor force, as well as the protagonist position of the entrepreneurial class in fostering a counter, counter insurgent strategy that aims to militarize community settings or community resistance, assassinating and incarcerating indigenous male and female leaders, ancestral authority, Mapuche activists, and strategically attacks women, children, and elders who are protagonists in the defense and, protect, uh, and projection of the native life and territory. So, in particular, the the Muikuikui community to which I'm referring here is a very emblematic community because it's one of those uh, communities that has a very long history of what I call refusal against uh, the, 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 the jurisdiction and authority of the Chilean nation state. So it's not at random that then uh, in 2017 they refused to join the National Census of the State of Chile. It's part of a long history of um, autonomous, um, it's a sense of territorial autonomy. Um, and what territorial autonomy means in the context of, uh, in the specific context of Mapuche politics, because this speaks back to Jarvis's presentation. Uh, because uh, 
the, the concept of the, Mapu the Mapuche movement began to use in the 1980s was a, for a, the, 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 the recuperation of ancestral lands was recuperación territorial. So which can be translated into English as land recovery. Was the kind of linguistic or lexical move there? Though familiar to Latin American history and the agrarian reform periods in the 1950s, 1960s, or the early 1970s, this may think back about toma de terrenos, toma de tierras, land takeovers. So we the Mapuche don't think in those terms. For us, it's land recovery, which goes to the idea of a recovering ancestral land, a gain full community control over a specific land that is ancestral in, uh, for the Mapuche, uh, making it fertile and generative of uh, organically grown uh, vegetables and all that. So uh, that's why I'm thinking about this possible conversation between, between the idea of the garden plot mm -hmm and the idea of land, uh, land recovery and the autonomous indigenous poly uh, in a, a, a politics of a, a indigenous autonomy in the Mapuche movement. So, but it's very interesting to think also about land the notion of recovery in the sense of what uh, this community, this type of autonomous community take care of is not only the health, the good health of the, the actual people, but also the good health of the land, land mm -hmm. recovery. So there is a whole regener regenerative narrative of life and the land. And also I'm thinking, uh, uh, this made me think while you were presenting mm -hmm. about the role of uh, gardening mm -hmm. uh, 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 on tribal college, in tribal, uh, on tribal colleges campus. Mm -hmm. And also in Spelman College, for example, mm -hmm. you have the Victory mm -hmm. Garden mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing about uh, reconnecting to the land in a very regenerative sense, but uh, uh, also uh, connected to a sort of, sort of uh, sense of communal care. Mm -hmm. So as a community, as a community, I'm close to end here. Uh, let's see the time. Yeah. As a community, in continuous protection of its territorial autonomy against the invasiveness of the corporate forestry industry, the Temucucuy community is constantly subject to the harassment of militarized Chilean police. It is the resistance of a community that emb embraces the clamor of the Mapu in the middle of an ecological catastrophe. In this sense, the Temukurkui community's refusal to the 2017 Chilean national census constituted a way to put into practice the Mapuche principle of Kisugunegun, which refers to the communal, communal ability for self-governance and autonomy. Um, this idea of Kisugunegun is also very uh, close to uh, what the Maya Saltira Central Community coined as a, a, a Puyectal, no? uh, which is another uh, Maya notion of a, a sort of a self determination over a specific local uh, ancestral uh, territory. So, Kisugunegun. Is a concept in Mapudungun that, according to Mapuche scholar Hector Nahuelpan, embodies the very idea of political and territorial autonomy that runs throughout the liberation struggle of Walmapu in the present day. In conclusion, the literary, let me see what else I have here for you. <laughs> so that can help too, because when I'm talking about the, jurid the, the jurisdiction of uh, the Chilean nation state uh, supporting uh, this invasive uh, forestry industry, uh, that those are the kind of legal points of reference. Mm -hmm. The literary, historiographical, and community acts that I have described and commented on in this presentation constitute instantiations 
instantiations of what we the Mapuche define as Aznapu. That is our own customs and norms that guide our life relations based on a continuous respect for the land who hosts us. By embracing the native land, these textual and non-textual events constitute acts, in my view, of indigenous liberation that interfere and suspend the legal and geopolitical scripts and mandates of the settler colonial nation state. Likewise, these become acts through which the autonomous exercise of indigeneity blows up hegemonic, hegemonic configurations of temporality, space, and law. Given the hegemonic deployment of indigeneity as a mere device to legitimize the rule of settler nation states, the literary, historiographical, and communal, communal acts I have discussed here offers ways to think about and imagine indigenous land-based engagement as the possibility of embracing and struggling, dreaming as well as exercising alternative subjective and community views and practices alternative to the prevailing state-centered politics and law of our time. In the middle of a civilization and ecological crisis, it is the urgency of a different clamor. Mapunipeuma wirempimekei tain fu piukimeu. Mapunipeuma wirempimekei tain fu piukimeu. The dream of the land that shouts in our hearts. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm going to sit now because for conversation. <laughs> I don't want to pontificate that much. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, next, I'd like to stop such a lively conversation that goes well for um, this afternoon and speaks to the richness of the presentations we've had so far. Um, we will continue with Miguel Rabago Dorbecker, a professor of law at the Centro de Estudios de Investigaciones, e Investigaciones Económicas, the Center for the Study in, Invest in Economic Investigations um, in Mexico City. He has previously been a, a professor at the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia, Universidad Federal de Pará in Brazil, and the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. His main areas of research are related to law and the humanities, international law, and legal theory. He is currently researching the production of food and peasants' rights as well as the work of the final reports of truth commissions in Latin America. And as a respondent, we have, I don't know if you've heard of this, uh, Hector Rojas, today, <laughs> um, a scholar of modern Latin American and comparative literature, who writes about the ideological critique of globalization in post-1989 Latin American novel, the articulation of critical theory and new materialism in the region's cultural production and related topics. See, for example, his book, Things with the History, Transcultural Materialism, and the Literatures of Extraction in Contemporary Latin America. And he's at work right now on a monograph that examining the works of Gabriel Garcia Marquez from a law and humanities perspective and has an incredible graduate student. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I cannot stress that I'm very, very happy to be here. It may seem a bit silly, but I'm very, very happy to be here. It's been a um, wonderful morning. And thank you very much, Joseph, and for uh, your generosity and also your closeness and the possibility of really opening a space in which we can really talk about the things we really like. You know, <laughs> really nice. So first of all, uh, I'm going to be centering in two material objects, maybe we can say it like that, which is La Noche Tlas del Orco, which is widely known, I think, in Latin American studies, mostly. It's a, what is it? Uh, it's a testimonio, no? A, a compilation of testimonios by Elena Poniatowska, 
uh, that is centered around the events that happened on the 2nd of October, 1968, in a place called Tlatelolco in Mexico City, where there was a massacre of basically student protesters, but there were also uh, union organizers, uh, also um, other workers, and also other people who cannot be just uh, classified as students, no? And the second object, is the Memorial del 68, which is kind of the official, not only narrative, but official place in actually in Tlatelolco, in the place meters from where the massacre took place, no? uh, which is a memorial for the students and other people who were killed in 68. So this is basically what I, <laughs> I'm trying to, to talk about, these two objects. No? And also, I would like to uh, well first explain a bit about uh, those of Turin 68. You know what happened? What's the context? What's the context with the global 68? You no, know, in, in Mexico. The second thing I will try to talk about post 68 politics, especially during the presidency of Luis Echeverria Alvarez. This has to do with something uh, with law. Don't worry about that. And the third part is going to be three. Uh, main points around these interventions, as Sector invited us to do, no? with law. No? The first one is Mexico's position during the Cold War, which can be explained around the 68 um, events, and especially around the Third World Movement no? and the new international economic world order. No? Second, legal mobilization before and after the frame of the rule of law orthodoxy. Obviously, this is before the rule of law orthodoxy, and how in many ways there's some legal mobilization, believe it or not, in 68. And the third point and final one is the underlying tension that with the monument, with the Memorial de 68, and also with the narrative of Elena Poniatowska and many of the literatura de Tlatelolco, which is, believe it or not, a literary genre in Mexico, a subgenre of, liter of literature in Mexico how there's a tension with the way in which Mexico has basically administered its past, its violent past, and the basic hegemony of transitional justice. So these are the three points. Well, first of all, in 68, oh, I don't know if this works. <laughs> Ah, there. Um, there. It's your. Can you try one more time? Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, the images are very important, no? Because 68 is uh, the massacre of Tlatelolco, is Tlatelolco. And if you're not familiar with Tlatelolco, this is Tlatelolco. The idea of Mexican modernity, mm -hmm. probably the embodiment of the uh, Milagro Mexicano, Economico Mexicano. And it's a housing complex which is actually built in a very important historical site where arguably uh, the, Mex the Spaniards won the, 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 basically defeated the Mexicas allies in Tlatelolco, no? and this was the start of the formal colonization of Mexico. So mm -hmm. it's also called the Plaza de las Tres Culturas, which embodies the three Mexicos, it's the official narrative. One, let me see if I can, uh, can see it here, but it's not a good picture, it's my picture, so mm -hmm. uh, this is, a. Uh, like the modern place, uh, the, modern, it, the complex is here, the housing complex, which was built by Mario Pani, which is the same architect as Ciudad Universitaria in Mexico City, where the, uh, the National University rests, no? And uh, this is the, uh, was the former uh, foreign relations building known as the Tlatelolco building, which also has a, a kind of the, the Name is important for law because the Treaty of Tlatelolco for denuclearization uh, in Latin America was signed actually in that place. So it's filled with histories. No? And there's also a colonial building, a uh, 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 church. No? This is why it's called the Plaza de las Tres Culturas, which is the ancient uh, Mexico, no? uh, basically the ruins of Tlatelolco, then the colonial Mexico the church, and then the modern Mexico with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. No? And this is where the massacre took place. Well, before going into the, the book, 
basically the mass the massacre of 68 of the 2nd of October 1968 is one of the main events in Mexican history to many it's the determinate place and determinate date in which the pre regime lost its hegemony in many ways no why because it was the new middle class born out of the Mexican miracle who started to uh, go to the now mostly uh, more uh, with more funds and more uh, admission, the, the public the public universities absorb the need for for uh, higher education, especially the, the with the new architectural plans of Ciudad Universitaria and Instituto Politécnico Nacional, and this new students started coming in masses to uh, public education, especially centered in Mexico. City, you know? so these students are the ones who are the protagonists of the manifestations of the 2nd of October 1968. Maybe many of you know this, but this is just days before the 68th Olympics were going to be taking place in Mexico City. So uh, basically Mexico City was going to be like a, a window shop for Mexican modernity and for the pre-regime. And this plan kind of falls down with uh, the student protest. So this is basically the uh, backdrop to all this, to this book, no? And Literatura de Tlatelolco is this subgenre, genre, sorry, which includes not only uh, this type of writings like Elena's Poniatoska's La Noche de Tlatelolco, which are mostly testimonies of what happened in the 2nd of October, but also literature around or about or circumnavigating the events of the 2nd of October, 1968. My favorite is not La Noche de Tlatelolco, no? My favorite is Amuleto by Roberto Bolaño, no? Because it's a very strange story because it's a Uruguayan poet who actually existed, who was a friend of Bolaño, who went to Café La Habana a lot with him and who was supposedly or mythically uh, when the police raided the UNAM in 68, no? She was in the uh, bathroom of the Facultad de Filosofía y Letras where I studied for a while. And she stayed there for, I don't know how many days until she noticed that the, the army wasn't there anymore no? after this. So, I mean, there's, it's a subgenre which is very interesting, but if you ask any Mexican, and I would ask anyone in the room, no, the Mexicans in the room, basically this is your, your reference for uh, what happened in 68. And it's very important that it's the reference because it kind of works like an archive. Uh, La Noche Tlatelolco consists, I would divide it in four parts, no? The first part is a photographic essay, maybe, very close to new journalism in the US and the UK a bit. They, they, they always, in, in literary studies, they think Elena Poniatos is kind of, and Monsi Bai sometimes, uh, kind of related to this movement, that there's some controversy around this, but it's a photo <laughs> essay in which many of the photos are going to be published for the first time in no newspapers in Mexico, but in this book. And they're not going to be published for many years until Proceso opened uh, the, the, the archive. No, there was, for national security reasons, um, very uh, difficult to get to and in the 2000s. I mean, this, this was going to be a long time afterwards in which those pictures wouldn't be uh, accessible, no? So the first part is this photographic essay. The second part are the events leading to the 2nd of October. In the third um, chapter, or which is the second chapter, the third part is uh, eponymously named La Noche de Tlatelolco, and it's what happens when the night falls in, no? And it's basically the story of the repression. But if you've read any, anything from Elena Poniatowska, uh, this is kind of a mix. Uh, it, 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 she kind of mixes journalism with, uh, with current events and everything. But this book is very special because it's not only the photographic essay, but it's uh, testimonies, basically testimonies. And not only of the leaders, the leaders are well represented in, in La Noche de Tlatelolco, Luis Gonzalez de Alba, who has his own chronicle, no? with, which counterpoints a lot and which brought him to a big fight with Elena Poniatowska because he says he used to sustain that he was uh, wrongly quoted in the book and everything, uh, has another day, Los Dias Los Años, no? which is written in the prison after he was detained after 68, no? 
Palacio Negro de Lecumberri, very famous prison, where the National Archive now rests, no? and where, paradoxically, all the official files of Tlatelolco rest also. Mm -hmm. No, not only the prisoners, but then the files. <laughs> uh, so La Noche, La Noche Tlatelolco has been translated to English. It was translated fairly fast, no? four years afterwards, I think, something like that. No, and it was um, translated into this. Let me publish our yes. other <laughs> massacre in Mexico. No, very <laughs> convenient title. But uh, still, uh, the strange thing, more contemporary, is if we have this book, yes, a yeah. massacre in Mexico. It's true story behind only eight. No, <laughs> massacre in Mexico. The true story behind the missing forty-three children, uh, students. No, which, if you know, it's talking about. This is a, a book by Anabel Hernandez which is a very famous um, Mexican journalist, no? It, it mostly works with violence and especially narco violence in Mexico, mm. and very controversial in many ways, no? But this book refers to the forced disappearance of 43 students, or we should say 42, because one has been recognized as officially dead by his, parent, his parents, no? But 43 students, no? In Guerrero, who were actually going on a bus to commemorate Dos de Octubre to Mexico City. So mm -hmm. Historica has a very horrible way of repeating itself in Mexico, no? not only for earthquakes, also for. <laughs> so uh, basically, we, these are the photos like in, in La Noche de Tlatelolco, these are the pre mobilizations. It's a very famous photograph, no? you can see the, the vibe. How does this link to the global? 68 or the long 60s, no, in many ways. This is a controversial issue because for many contemporary um, uh, uh, academics now, there's a tendency to narrate the events of 68 in Mexico like kind of a new left uh, international uh, description in many ways. But the official never narrative of 68 is very local in many ways. Sometimes uh, kind of used to negate the the all the, the, the global issues, no? And this is a delicate issue because one of the ways in which the government, especially the Secretary of Interior, Secretary, Secretary of Gobernación, justified his violent actions to the US Embassy and to you and to even to US President Richard Nixon was that it, this was a conspir global conspiracy of global communism, even though this person was Luis Echeverria Alvarez, Afterwards, he would be known as, uh, how can we say it, a global defender of third world politics and a global defender of, uh, in many ways, uh, open the gates for a lot of uh, political refugees from Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Brazil, Bolivia, and other places. No? So very contradictory uh, precedent. No? But the thing is that if you inscribe it in the global 60s, the problem is that you kind of incorporate the Cold War narrative. And that was the official narrative for the repression. So it's, but still there is some points of contact between Global 68 and there is some new left, uh, how can I say, connecting points with the 68 movement, especially culturally. Uh, the Memorial de 68, in my point of view, which is this, we'll skip to that a bit, this place. No, it used to be the foreign uh, affairs office. No, you see that this uh, uh, tries to emulate the, the footprints of, of people in Tlateloco Square. No, mm -hmm. but and you see the ruins here. No, very close to that. Uh, but inside, it's kind of a pastiche of many things. No, it recreates Elena Poniatowska. This is not my idea. This is uh, Jose Ramon Ruiz Sanchez's idea that. It recreates completely La Noche de Tlatelolco's testimony because the main hall is filled with uh, people who participated in 68 giving their testimony at the same time. So you kind of have a cacophony, which is the word that is used to describe the testimonials in, in Elena Poniatowska's novel by many literary analysts. And you kind of get, uh, you, you kind of get disoriented of all the different stories of 68 that you hear because they're blasting through the, the the sound, no, and you have to get close to each person in order to uh, really focus on, on their story, no. So 
I mean, Memorial de 68 is said to be like the visual uh, aesthetic of La Noche de Tlatelolco. So this is the real weight of La Noche de Tlatelolco. It's not only the archive, which many people and many people who know about 68 grew up with, with almost the unofficial official narrative, mm -hmm. no? Uh, but also, it, is, it has been repeated in many ways. First of all, with Luis González de Alba's own, who's a leader of 68, he was the leader for the Facultad de Filosofía y Letras. He was also a leader for in a, one of the first leaders of the gay liberation movement in Mexico. So it's a very interesting figure. He did, then became a very conservative, conservative figure, very polemic figure. And I have a personal anecdote there that I'll tell you <laughs> later, no? But uh, he committed suicide on the 2nd of October, 1968, 2016. Well, very sad. But the thing is that Luis Gonzalez de Alba kind of said, well, Ponia Tosca took, uh, misquoted me. Uh, this is kind of a, let's say, a reflection of La Noche de Tlatelolco with uh, Los Días y Los Años. There's also the, the Apanado, which is more a novel by Jose Revueltas, who's one of the intellectual masterminds of 68 and one of the most theoretically sound uh, Mexican intellectuals of the left, no? And there's also uh, this kind of kitsch literature of uh, Regina by Velasco Piña, which is a bestseller kind of pseudo-religious uh, uh, sect in which, he, he's a leader of a sect, I think, mm -hmm. in which there's the main character is uh, a young girl who's uh, protesting and gets killed in 68. But this is kind of the popular take on 68 also. And there's also Luis Espota, which is a very bad novelist in many ways, a very bad writer, no was and who does the official account of the pre of the ruling party for uh, the uh, Noche Tlatelolco, which is called La Plaza, the Plaza, no? So, I mean, there's all this different contentious memories, no? But the interesting thing is, is as Mexico, how can I say this? Because <laughs> as Mexico entered electoral competition, <laughs> no, more electoral competition, not transition, not democracy, <laughs> but whatever. No? Electoral competition. No, uh, the role of La Noche Tlatelolca and the writer, Elena Poniatowska, changed. Elena Poniatowska in 1970 wrote this book and she was awarded officially, this is only in Mexico, uh, awarded officially by the government, who by Conaculta, no, the Javier Villarrutia Prize in 1970, which she famously rejected, saying that the dead, dead won't talk. So why we should mm -hmm. receive this, this, uh, this prize? No? So the thing is, uh, this is kind of the, you will understand the hegemony of the pre like this. It controls, it represses, it kills, it buys, it, it comforts you, it gives you freedom, it takes it away, <laughs> very contradictory. No, but it's kind of explains, of, and this is Luis Echeverria. I mean, and during his government, the main, res main politician responsible for 68 gives, uh, not only does not censor the 1970 uh, publication of La Noche Tlatelolco, but also gives the national prize for uh, literature to La Noche Tlatelolco, which he doesn't accept, no. But also, Elena Poniatowska has been very close to the uh, first the PRD, which was uh, an offspring, left offspring of the PRI, and now Morena, which is, I leave you to decide what, what it is, no? but it's uh, the ruling uh, party in Mexico, of which, which was founded by Andrés Manuel López Obrador. No? So she was very close to Andrés Manuel López Obrador. She's been giving the Premio Cervantes. She's been uh, very much uh, this government has been very close to Elena Pernatowska. So the narrative around La Noche de was never official in many ways. It was permitted. But now it, uh, the government is starting a truth commission, an official truth commission, which is very, has been very problematic because uh, there are very uh, good people in, uh, working in the truth commission, but it has a lack of funding. Uh, the relationship with the government has been complicated, especially with the army, and the access to documents has been very difficult. No? So uh, this truth commission tries to narrate the story since 68. This is not the first commission. 
Another paradox of Mexican memory is that Pablo Gomez, who was, he was now in the, uh, an official in the government, he's an anti-corruption officer, was a leader in 68. Many leaders of 68 were named cabinet members in Luis Echeverria's government also, so then in later governments, in left governments, and also in pre-governments. But Pablo Gomez headed a congressional inquiry into 68, which is not very known. The local Congress in Guerrero led uh, an inquiry also. And there have, has been some unofficial and more NGO and more um, other, other efforts done by civil society to make truth reports. But if you, this is uh, the point which, in which we can relate to trans transitional justice, if you understand the mainstream and the hegemonic model of transitional justice, this doesn't seem like a truth commission, like the ones, every truth commission is different, but I mean, the model, the UN based model, which is which was more present in Salvador, for example, which is more present in other efforts, no? In Guatemala a bit also, no? In, in post-conflict societies in Latin America, this is not really the truth commission model. It's kind of negotiating. In, the thing that I want to go back to the text of La Noche de Tlatelolco is if you read the testimonies in La Noche de Tlatelolco, they read quite similarly textually to a final report of a truth commission, let's say mm. in Peru, in the new Colombia, mm. in uh, Chile, in Argent in Nunca Mas, in Argentina. No? Mm. And if you think of it as a kind of informal truth report, then it would be one of the best-selling truth reports with Nunca Mas. <laughs> no? so, Maybe it's 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 a literary phenomenon, no? In many ways. So just uh, to go back to the law issues, no. So Luis Echeverria was the Secretary of State during the '68 uh, movement, no? Secretary of State, I mean Secretary of Interior, no, is the one responsible for uh, the not only relationships with with other powers, but also in that moment, the relationship with the Mexican, Mexico City police, which was very important for the repression and with the army, you know, especially. So he's basically responsible for the orders given in the massacre of students, which we don't know the number. It's officially from tens to hundreds of people. You know? Depends on who you ask. But the thing is that Luis Echeverria afterwards in his, his presidencies from 70, 76, was a, a strong advocate, especially with his Minister of Foreign Relations, Foreign Relations, Carlos Cast uh, Jorge Castañeda. Sorry, Carlos Castañeda is a Peruvian. <laughs> 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 Why not? <laughs> Peruvian, no, no. Uh, Jorge Castañeda, no, father, because it's Jorge Castañeda Goodman. You know, who was also uh, um, Minister of Foreign Affairs with President Fox, no? So Jorge Castañeda was very a a advocating for the especially new international economic order, no? The resolution regarding permanent sovereignty over natural resources. He was also uh, an advocate of the recognition as uh, uh, a former subject of international humanitarian law of the Frente Parabundo Martí de Liberación Nacional. So he's very, it's a, it's a moment in which uh, international law activism in Mexico is very high, you know, and especially third world is. Uh, Echeverria had no uh, restrictions on presenting himself as a third world president and trying to uh, use non alignment in, in a way. So it's very contradictory in this sense. So this brings me to uh, TWAIL, uh, Third World Approaches to International Law. And the, uh, the normally, and this has been refuted by uh, some books uh, recently regarding uh, the focus on CEPAL and focus on the, 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 the point of view of Latin America in uh, TWAIL and in uh, outside of the Bannon Conference, which is mostly the, the new research and the, the focus of, of TWAIL, no? So kind of the thing is that Tlatelolco is the seat of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's the seat, it was the seat during those years in which uh, Mexican foreign policy turned into the third world, but it's also the seat in which the Cold War was manifested 
brutally in the repression of uh, the 68 students. So it's kind of this double game of the regime in which it talks Cold War politics to the US, it justifies its acts in Cold War politics, but then officially in UN and CEPAL and other forums, international forums works with terrorism. So I think there's, there's, a, it's, there's not only a formal uh, relationship with law because there's uh, the production of this legal material in the UN General Assembly, in uh, other parts of the UNCLOS Convention, and this brief period in which Mexico was really, really trying to uh, to push for third worldism, you know? but also in the discourse. You know? And also, paradoxically, in the discourse of the students protesting, because Vietnam in the global 60s was a basic issue, and it also appeared in 68, it was not the main issue, which takes me to the second legal issue, which is legal mobilization. You know? A very, uh, not very well known fact is that before the 68 massacre, there, were, uh, there was an intervention to the National University and especially to the Escuela Nacional Preparatoria, which is the UN high school. If you've ever been to Mexico City, this is now San Ildefonso, which is uh, where the murals are and uh, a museum, a very good museum, and it's a wonderful place. And it's also where the Sala Justo Sierra is, no? a very impressive Diego Rivera mural in a very, very beautiful place. No, but this was the national uh, high school where most students went to study before UNAM. No, and also it's like, you can see that it's the UNAM's most visible historical building. I mean, uh, it's Ciudad Universitaria is where it is now, but if for a colonial building, that and the, the School of Medicine are the most visible. No? So, uh, in, in when, when these events are happening, the first thing that happens is that students form what is called uh, CNH, Comité Nacional de Huelga, which is a very radical deliberative uh, council in which everything is discussed. It's not the typical vanguard Marxist Leninist style, it was really the, the participatory democratic organ in which. All, if you talk to people who were involved in the 68 pro uh, process, they, they would say, well, in 68, the problem is that there was all assemblies and it was very hard to get things uh, together because there was all those voices. No? So it was very, very democratic. No? So in the Comité Nacional de Huelga wrote a very famous six points, six demands. No? One of them, well, I could make the argument that all of them are related to law, but one of them is strictly legal. It says the derogation of the articles, of two articles of the penal code, you know, which uh, basically define what was known as the crime of social dissolution, which is a very open criminal, uh, criminal uh, crime description. So it was used constantly by the police to detain students and other left-wing organizations and protesters. You know? So my point is that with these narratives of rule of law, afterwards World Bank interventions and post restructuring of debt in the 90s and post neoliberal uh, Latin America, the rule of law discourse for Latin America, this has been studied by Mauricio Garcia Villegas, this has been studied, this is a point of view of Mauricio Garcia Villegas, but this has also been studied by Jorge Esquirol much more critically, you know, and uh, in the context of, of uh, human rights in Colombia by Jorge Gonzalez or other people, the discourse in which Latin America is a place where rule of law doesn't work and where legality and legal mobilization doesn't work because the undertone, and especially Mauricio Garcia Villegas, I think, uh, uh, writings is that because communists didn't believe in law, I don't know, basically, uh, uh, because the left didn't believe in law and the governments don't, didn't apply the law, no, and the revolutionary movements did, were interested in law, kind of falls down because, I mean, in 68 in Mexico, these points, one of them was a concrete derogation of two criminal uh, uh, code articles. It was legal mobilization, basic legal mobilization in this course, no? And also it talked about uh, the, the disappearance of the Granaderos, which was a para-police uh, unit, no? So I mean, there's a lot of legality in that discourse. And this is never understood under that traditional discourse that in Latin America, legality has 
either been imposed by the rule of law hegemony or legality has never worked because we had Marxist movements and they didn't believe in law or because uh, basically it's a, a state of, of law, lawlessness. No? And many arguments move around that. And my third and final argument with the law is process all the presentation is this tense relationship with transitional justice. No? If we go back to the way in which 68 has been administered, I would say it was more administered through the literary and effective um, memory of the leaders, of the students, of like me, sons or daughters of people who were remotely related to 68 or whatever, no, or who read those books or who came from the left, who was very influenced by 68, no? More than in an official matter uh, under the tutelage of transitional justice. And this is kind of, I mean, a, a way in which Mexico has so, by the human rights movement, especially in the 90s and with the, with the, at the end of the 90s and with the uh, first presidency of um, Vicente Fox, which incorporated some human rights uh, activists into his government, was very questioned because many human rights activists said there's never been a truth commission in Mexico. There's never been transitional justice in Mexico. You can hear this in, in the human rights uh, elite a lot in Mexico. No? But the, the other part is, well, maybe we had our own precautions, our own ways of interpreting transitional justice. And the, it's more in the symbolic space where transitional justice has been fought. And maybe those memories and those cacophonies of 68, which are represented in the Noche Atlas del Orco, are really more important, as we can see in the Memorial de 68, than really the final report of the truth commissions, which in many cases, I defend the truth commissions, especially Peruvian, and especially, I mean, uh, Colombia was, uh, it took massive amounts of political energy and it moved a, a lot of uh, regions and groups and everything, and a lot of uh, indigenous movements, the, the Proceso de Comunidades Negras, the Afro-Colombian uh, movement really put a lot of effort into the truth commission, mm -hmm. But still, I mean, there are other ways of doing it. There are other ways, uh, narrative ways of narrating things. And if we, I don't tend to erase or to demerit the importance of, of the final reports of the truth commissions, but they're narratives. And those narratives compete with other narratives. And mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. why should we privilege one kind of narrative over another? You know? So mm -hmm. basically, I would go back to, to the first point, no, if you have a lot to talk about, but we don't have the time, no, but uh, if post 68, these are all photographs of La Noche de no, is post 68, Mexico looks like this, no, which is the 85 air earthquake, which destroyed the Edificio Nuevo León in Tlatelolco. It seems like everything happens there, no, and it fell down. This is like the fall of Mexican modernity of the project of the PRI, but also this is a time where civil society, Carlos Monsivais has written a lot of, about this, no? Uh, organizes itself, and this is the origin of the left wing in the uh, more uh, democratic government in Mexico City. So if the 68 building or pre-68 building fell down, no? It's like the local, what would a new truth commission when the left or a government that at least has symbolically some ties to the left or tries to use this language of the left, of the left how is it gonna uh, narrate the, or re-narrate the narratives that were so plural, so cacophonous of 68? Do we finally get the official version, which strangely enough, looks like originally what Elena Poniatowska did? And I just, would like to finish with the idea of Elena Poniatowska being hogged. He doesn't hog a lot of people, <laughs> but by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and calling her Elenita very incorrectly in many ways. No, but will this become the official narrative of 68? No, this and what happens in, in Memorial de Santa And the personal anecdote, but we want to hear it. Uh, Luis Gonzalez de Alban came to. My father's office in 
Agosto, in August, yeah, probably, um, no, September of 2016. And he said he wanted to do his will. My father is a notary public. Notario Publico in Mexico, you have to write your will with a notary public. And he, he hadn't seen him since 68. So we saw him and mm -hmm. what are you doing in Guadalajara? No? What are you doing? No, I want to write my will. Okay, go to his will, give him a book. And three days afterwards, he killed himself. Oh. Very, very strong. Oh, no? Can you leave us on a nicer note with the picture of Elena <laughs> Poniatowska? No, I don't have that picture. Yeah, isn't, there, isn't there a picture yeah. of the, of the no, no. She was in the corner. No. The one where you have the poster of black and white? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I, I don't remember that. <laughs> I'm going with your black and white pictures. Yeah, ah, yeah, she's, she's no, she's not. No, that's not her. It looks like her. She yeah, has the same like haircut. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, it, the same was I thought it was her. I thought it was, funny, it was no, her. This is, I thought it was her. I'm sorry. The thing I could explain in in there, which is more positive, even though we had we took a, a break from transitional justice, let's say that way. Of course, this happens in '68, and truth commissions and the first truth commissions after the mid '80s, '84, and come out, no. So, I mean, afterwards, uh, the thing is that Mexico always likes to talk about the Mexican exception, especially with the PRI, no? But still, the Mexican exception is false, because if you see that photograph, could, this could be Chile, this could be Argentina, this could be Peru, this could be El Salvador, this could be Guatemala, this could be anywhere. It's a mother asking for, uh, asking where is the child, no? And with the, and also, it rings a tone that now with the humanitarian disappearance crisis right now, no, mm -hmm. still uh, this image is perpetuated in many ways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miguel. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have uh, the immense pleasure of Let's say the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No big deal. Uh, more amazing presentations. All we have to do is just have one to bring it all together. Uh, Yogita Goyo is a professor of African American Studies and English at UCLA and the author of Romance, Diaspora, and Black Atlantic Literature and Runaway Genres The Global Afterlives of Slavery. His last book, which won just the Rene Wellek Prize from the ACLA, the Perkins Prize. At from the International Society for the Study of Narrative, an honorable mention for the James Russell Lowell Prize from the MLA. The past president of ASAP, she has published widely on African diaspora, post-colonial, and US literature, and is working on the genres of anti-colonialism, a study of mid-20th century anti-colonial thought and its current revival. Bindai Yachiyume, our double UCLA panel, <laughs> the inaugural Alicia Mignana, a professor of law and former faculty director of the UCLA Law Promise Institute for Human Rights. The current focus of her work is the global governance of racism and xenophobia and the legal and ethical implications of colonialism for contemporary international migration. She received the Distinguished Teaching Award in 2020, UCLA's highest honor for excellence in teaching. And she is joining us at the 2023 academic year uh, as a visiting professor at Stanford Law School. A wonderful combination. So please pass the board. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you to Joe and um, Hector for everything that you've done to bring us together. And I should say that um, in the previous panel, um, Hector said that no conference worth attending keeps to its timetable. So I should also say that no conference worth attending doesn't have at least one paper that bombs that you're all complaining about. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, after the four marvelous papers that we've had, that's sort of my charge here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, this is the post-post-lunch um, panel. And so let me just frame the paper a little bit in, in context, and then I'll get right to it. Um, I, I wanted to think about anti-colonialism, which is in the title of our uh, discussion today, as itself itself is an object of inquiry in sort of a, a messy and processual way, right? So that it's not a stable object, I think, for us to recover at this moment in time. 
And I'm thinking particularly about in, in the book that I'm writing at the mid 20th century moment, but I think it speaks to other forms of anti-colonial theory as well. And so I'm looking here at, I'm thinking about how anti-caste activists um, did not form any kind of seamless coalition with anti-colonialism that was focused on national liberation, right? So that, that's kind of one of the ways in which I think it connects with what we're talking about. And part of this is a desire, and I think we've heard this before here, and it's certainly been a part of my work so far, desire to find alternatives to the nation state form, right? As, as a kind of um, place where some of our European desires can, can find uh, some kind of home. And in part, we can find these in minoritarian dialogues, whether they're named by Black Atlantic or by internationalism or by Bandung. And I also don't want to reify these as historical givens. I think they're also open for inquiry. So I don't mean a kind of nostalgic turn, and so this is why I want to take questions of failure, shaming, competition, misrecognition seriously. How are the ways race and caste do not translate, right? How are the ways they entangle? How are the ways they illuminate? But also how are the ways these comparisons obscure? Um, and so part of the energy here is to push back against trans-historical ways of theorizing race. Um, so just, just as a little bit of a preamble to what I'm doing. Uh, the talk is called Globalizing Caste, Race, Caste, and Comparison. So in 2001, Human Rights Watch created a report called Caste Discrimination, a Global Concern for the U United Nations World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance in Durban. The report focused on Dalits in South Asia, so they named Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan, the Buraku people of Japan, the Osu of Nigeria's evil people, and certain communities in Senegal and Mauritania. Instead of focusing on religion or Hinduism in particular, the report emphasized discrimination based on work and descent, acknowledging the common language of pollution and ritual impurity, bans against intermarriage and other forms of social segregation in many of these sites, but really drawing attention to labor and to occupational hierarchies as key facets of caste discrimination. Noting that caste discrimination affects some 250 million people worldwide, the report asked for a concerted pledge of international action. Now, as we know from what happened at the World Conference Against Racism, no such pledge was taken. India, Israel, and the United States joined hands to refuse consideration of caste discrimination, Zionism, and reparations for slavery and colonialism in 2001. This is a familiar story of failure. And I begin here not so much to re revisit this specific flashpoint, but to unravel a set of entangled logics about comparisons of race, caste, and class on the one hand, and local, national, and global scales on the other. My hope is that revisiting a much longer history of attempted juxtapositions of race and caste may tell us something about what exactly race and caste are, the ontology of each, but also how they are historicized, embedded in other social forms, how they become modalities that not only house all parity, but code relations of power. And I should stop here and say, Tenda, your previous question about race and indigeneity across the global South is, is really uh, germane. I should also say I'm so thrilled that you will respond to uh, this talk. There are certain storied moments in over a century of such race caste comparisons. Most famous is the formation of the Dalit Panthers in the 1970s in Bombay, an explicit tribute to the militancy of the Black Panthers. Equally well known is the 1946 exchange between W.E.B. Du Bois and Himrao Ramji Ambedkar about the common cause of Dalits and African Americans and the possibility of turning to the UN for securing their human rights. Or the claim that we find in so many recent academic books explaining the decision to capitalize Dalit, right, the D of Dalit, by recalling Du Bois's insistence on doing the same for the word Negro. Many of these familiar instances follow a similar structure. A political concept or strategy develops in the US and is then adopted or adapted by the post colony. In other words, political radicalism originates elsewhere and is then refashioned for use in India. In contrast, of course, we have the famous instance of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s adoption of Gandhian nonviolence and his 1959 visit to India where he publicly claimed that he was a fellow untouchable. And much of the conversation about the race caste analogy participates in the sentiments that also animate the aspirational watchwords of 
Bandu, Afro-Asia, Third World, or Global South, all of which take the idea of relation and solidarity seriously. We may recall here Stuart Hall's caution against extrapolating a common universal structure to racism, since he writes, it is only as the different racisms are historically specified in their difference that they can be properly understood. So keeping this in mind, I want to turn to one such recent blockbuster effort of comparing race and caste, Isabel Wilkerson's cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, which came out in 2020. Dubbed by Oprah is the most important book I've ever <laughs> chosen for my book club. <laughs> you laugh, but it matters a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> An instant, dubbed it instant American classic by the New York Times, frequently selected by co colleges and cities for their one book reading program, and optioned for a feature film directed by Ava DuVernay. We're waiting for that to come out. <laughs> Wilkerson's book, to use the word, words of one critic, Yashika Dutt, is able to, quote, elevate thousands of years of Dalit trauma and struggle into the global spotlight in a single swoop. So I'd like to suggest that the circulation of Wilkerson's ideas serves as a kind of yardstick for how previous histories of radicalism in anti-racist and anti-colonial thought have come into the present. The book is an example of what Olukemi Taiwo in another context calls elite capture. The long history of discussions about race and caste only comes into view in pieces in the book. For the most part, in service of the loss of status, experienced by elite African-Americans in business class airplane cabins, boutiques on Michigan Avenue, or high-end restaurants. Questions of class and capitalism are overlooked in favor of appeals for the recognition of personal injury, thus offering little insight about either caste or race as forces in political life in India or the US. The book is driven by the conviction that the fluid and overdetermined nature of race and racism in the US should be replaced by an analytic of caste, to fully apprehend the depth of degradation experienced by African Americans. And so Wilkerson attributes a kind of rigidity and stasis to caste in order to make her point. In one of many metaphors elaborated in the book, she suggests that if race is a language, caste is the grammar. If race is the skin, caste is the skeleton. In other words, caste is both invisible and foundational, permanent and unchanging. The different historical moments of slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, and post-civil rights US thus all appear as evidence of a trans-historical caste system rather than as distinct racial regimes. Turning to caste, I think, affords Wilkerson access to an experiential affective register through which she collates moments that capture the persistence of discrimination. As she puts it, quote, moving about the world as a living, breathing caste experiment myself I wanted to understand the hierarchies that I and many millions of others have had to navigate to pursue our work and dreams. But her prescription for change is limited by her tendency to appeal to the sentiments of the dominant castes rather than to attend to the agency of the subordinated ones. So white recognition of often elite black injury is her focus. Such a focus runs afoul of the investments of discerning scholars of both race and caste, despite the rapturous reception elsewhere. Hazel Carby, for instance, finds the book limited by its US-centric understanding of Atlantic slavery and its refusal to consider migration from the Caribbean or the true scope of the African diaspora resulting from the Middle Passage. Carby reminds us of Portuguese colonial domination in Brazil or the fact that after the Abolition Act of 1833, the British repurposed slave ships to transport more than a million indentured laborers from India to work on plantations in their colonies around the globe resulting in the complex entanglements of caste and race in British Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad. Yashika Dutt takes issue with the flattening of Dalit lives and histories, and the refusal to consider present-day atrocities against Dalits in yet another example of American exceptionalism, since the book suggests that casteism is a fading reality in the Indian subcontinent. Ultimately, Dutt concludes, Wilkerson, this is, this is her, these are her words, Wilkerson forces readers to confront the implications of the skewed racial hierarchy. Yet for me, a Dalit reader often marginalized and restricted to the bottom of an even more lopsided global order, it often feels like being left out of my own history. Mm. Wilkerson's cast thus stands now as a measure of the work that needs to be done to make such comparisons between race and caste generative. As an example of the rise of the anti-racist bestseller in our era, 
it marks the changed landscape of the present, where we're not just dealing with the erasure of histories of race and empire, but rather with the packaging of these histories in the service of appealing to white audiences or resorting to personal feelings of injury as a benchmark for racial progress. So it poses the larger question of how formerly radical ideas circulate in the present, a present saturated with the rhetoric of endless crisis and suffused with a consciousness of failure. How might we not just revive and recall, but reconfigure earlier political alignments for a contemporary world that seems ever more complicated and hostile to such solidarities? A world where imagined anti-colonial coalitions of the wretched of the earth seem anachronistic, firmly of another time and place, legible only if refracted through notions of failure, loss, melancholy, or ruins and remains. So this is part of a larger project reassessing the rhetoric of failure, everything from failed state discourse to declarations of the demise of post-colonial critique to the failure of anti-colonialism to deliver the desired social and economic transformation of, after the end of empire. So I'm cutting this talk down from a much longer version, and I will give you a very, very compressed um, account of several moments that I consider in the long transnational dialogue about race, caste, and comparison. In the antebellum era, I look at the use of the idiom of caste to describe slavery by abolitionists, drawing on missionary accounts of India, which used caste to symbolize backwardness, oppression, and a kind of barbarism. I also turn to a vast number of writings by Du Bois, which frequently and often in contradictory ways theorized race and caste as analogies, as he also tried to think about the meaning of India's independence from Britain as an analog for African-American emancipation. Du Bois's variable use of color caste sometimes signals segregation, especially in the US South. At other times, the caste of work came to mean class, and the caste of color stood in for race, while racial caste denoted the legacy of slavery. And we could talk about this for several years, um, <laughs> but I will move on. I also look at activist and intellectual Jyoti Rao Kule's 1873 book, Gulambiri, or Slavery, dedicated to quote, the good people of the United States as a token of admiration for this sublime, disinterested, and self-sacrificing devotion in the cause of Negro slavery, and with and an earnest desire that my countrymen may take their noble example as their guide in the emancipation of their Shudra brethren from the trammels of Brahman thraldom. Pule was inspired by Harriet Beecher Stowe and presents the American example as a success story. At the same time that he suggests that Brahmins are not native to India, but invaders from Iran or Europe, recruiting indigeneity for his anti-caste purposes. Mm -hmm. The race-caste analogy often mobilizes shame and turns to a transnational setting in order to achieve a particular goal at home. Anupama Rao has compellingly argued that global conversations about caste allow it to, quote, gain social density and become a political identity of enduring consequence. In other words, what we look for when we review the history of these comparisons is not so much a logic, right? Are these claims based on language or indigeneity? Are they cultural, biological, or phenotypical, but an effect? Because Indian social reformers, anti-colonial nationalists, and state leaders insisted on seeing caste as local and singular, attempts at commensuration, whether to race or to class or to other forms of struggles for, commenced before emancipation, these attempts at commensuration bespeak the ways in which anti-caste thinkers had to globalize caste in order to historicize it. Here, we could think of a book like B.T. Rajshaker's 1979, um, Apartheid in India, which was reissued in 1987 under the new title, Dalit, the Black Untouchables of India, which mm -hmm. globalizes the cause of Dalit emancipation by using analogies from Nazi history, South African apartheid, and US slavery. So it's a kind of a precursor to Wilkerson, but without that global reach. Similar arguments emerged during the 2001 UN World Conference Against Racism. During the Durban debates, as it came to be called, the Indian government, led by the BJP, called on caste exceptionalism to claim the uniqueness of caste divisions, which make it an internal matter. Some even argued that to go to the UN with this issue was to succumb to neocolonialism, as US definitions of race were being taken as the norm against everything else should be measured. Deepankar Gupta's infamously summed up this sentiment. He says, 
We have ceded knowledge advantage to the West on one front after another, beginning with economic, then flowing on to the political, and now we need tips on how to handle cultural discrimination as well. In this way, race as a category of analysis becomes limited to the US alone, even as widely discredited notions of race as biology and caste as religion from colonial anthropology and pseudoscience resurrected themselves. In response, Dalit activists argued that distinctions of caste, like race, derive from ideas of lineage and descent and rely on a common language of purity, pollution, and contamination. They also pointed to the psychological impact of such distinctions on the Dalit mind and body. To achieve the global mobilization of caste, Dalit activists settled on the discourse of human rights at Durban, but needed a kind of tethering to a static, ahistorical definition of Hinduism as explanations of the origins of caste discrimination turned time and time again to claims of Indian society as inherently religious and hierarchical. As anthropologist Deepa Reddy notes, caste needed stasis to achieve mobility, the local to reach the global. In order to make the case that race and caste are comparable, advocates had to de-link caste from religion and relocate it as a form of discrimination based on work and descent as the Human Rights Watch report that I opened with. <clears throat> As endogamous groups where occupations are determined by birth, castes could be rescripted as universal rather than as specifically Hindu forms of oppression and social stratification in a manner similar to the efforts of early 20th century thinkers like Tagore, Ambedkar, Du Bois, and Lala Lajpat Rai. So in the 2001 casteism is more horrendous than racism, Durban and Dalit discourse, Prakash Lewis argued that the West has monopolized the discourse of race thus making it impossible to talk about caste as race and thus relevant to the global rather than the Indian community alone. Kancha Elia Shepherd notes that Indian nationalist leaders who went abroad and faced racism were blind to the same insults being levied and exploited castes at home. The primary strategy in the Durban debates then was to call on race-based oppression as a universally accepted form of discrimination that clearly elicits shame and abhorrence. As Shiv Vishwanathan wrote about Durban, race was the most universal language of condemnation. Race moved mountains like the UN, the foundations, and the corporations. If caste were defined as race in India, one retained local turfs, but could use international forums to embarrass the official Indian image. So here I want to return to Wilkerson. A mere two decades later, she reverses these Durban dynamics. Now race is the language that is insufficient to capture the extent and depth of anti-Black discrimination, which is why the vocabulary of caste comes into play to describe the United States. And if it seems like Wilkerson might be simply idiosyncratic in this turn and not representative of a larger logic, I would want us to consider that a book like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, 2010, widely received as a groundbreaking study of the relation between race today and past forms of oppression, uses the phrase racial caste on nearly every page of the book, in the blurb and in chapter titles. Her central claim is that slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration are distinct caste systems in America. Alexander uses the term caste precisely because it doesn't fit, to make her point that racial justice in America is mythical to highlight the shamefulness of current racial politics, thus drawing on caste as a signifier of extreme inequality, subordination based on dissent, and a backward form of social and political stratification. And I think Wilkerson turns to caste for the same reason. This, of course, raises the question that has haunted the analogy from the outset, the role of the missing term, class. When Alexander refers to, quote, a tightly networked system of laws, policies, customs, and institutions that operate collectively to ensure the subordinate status of a group defined largely by race, not as an underclass, but as an undercaste. It seems clear that we need to think about what has happened in contemporary political life, that such a charged comparison to caste has become preferable to the language of class and class struggle. These questions are, of course, not new. The Caste School of Race Relations, a group of American sociologists writing in the 1930s and 1940s, argued that it was more appropriate to describe Blacks and whites as castes rather than races or classes in the US South. Lloyd Warner's essay, American Caste and Class, 1936, John Dollard's Caste and Class in a Southern Town, 1937, 
and Alison Davis, Burley Gardner, and Mary Gardner's Deep South, a Social Anthropological Study of Caste and Class, 1941, explicitly equated caste and race and attempted to study the equivalences between racism and casteism as forms of institutionalized segregation. Gunnar Myrtle's An American Dilemma, 1944, that's probably the most well-known book from that era, mm -hmm. similarly argues that an optic of class, the norm for analyzing European societies, would not work in the United States because of its caste system. Myrtle not only wanted to move away from biological notions of race to socially constructed ones, he also wanted to highlight racism primarily as a moral question and locate it in the realm of the white conscience. Prominent black sociologists like Oliver Cromwell Cox, E. Franklin Frazier, and Charles S. Johnson strongly dis disagreed with the analogy with caste arguing for the importance of class and capitalism instead for the study of what was then called race relations. Cox, for instance, argued that race relations are a form of <clears throat> class exploitation. It made no sense to him to compare capitalism to Brahminism. <clears throat> Cox further assumed that caste in India was static, timeless, even natural calling the caste system ancient, provincial, culturally oriented, hierarchical in nature. For him, it lacked the dynamism of class relations under capitalism. In other words, caste is outside of history. Because for him, in the, this is him, in the caste system, there's no proletariat, no class struggle. So he worried that comparing race to caste would somehow abstract race from capitalism and naturalize it as timeless. So while he placed race in history, he took caste outside of it. For him, caste was local while race was global. This is again Cox. Caste has reference to the internal social order of a society. Race suggests a whole people, wherever found around the globe. Race sentiment and interest tend to be universal, while caste sentiment and interest tend to be circumscribed and localized. So as we can see, these debates return in our own time. And though Wilkerson <clears throat> claims Alison Davis as a spiritual father and dismisses Cox as a contrarian for his cantankerous critique, these questions linger. By returning to the debates about the caste school of American sociology, we can see how some of those same assumptions continue to fuel Wilkerson's underlying analysis. The turn to the personal, an appeal to white conscience, no real engagement with Indian history or politics or with Dalit activism, the occlusion of class, and the reification of both race and caste as analytics. As I continue thinking about these questions, I want to dig deeper into these decades of the 30s and the 40s when the analogy was a currency and has subsequently faded from our historical imagination. I have in mind here Penny von Eschen's persuasive account of the 1940s, where African American struggles for freedom were linked to anti colonial efforts in a substantial way. But with the onset of the Cold War in the 1950s, race and racism came to be understood as domestic internal issues but were also located internally as psychological problems to be overcome rather than rooted in structures of slavery and colonialism. Mm -hmm. And thus racism became rewritten as an ahistorical evil. Today, we perhaps face a similar conjuncture. Frames of racial capitalism, the black radical tradition, anti-colonialism as theory, decolonization and global justice movements have never been more visible. And as Anya Lumba has forcefully argued, both Atlantic and colonial and Indian exceptionalisms have long obstructed the comparison of race to caste, belying the fact that ideas of both race and caste themselves emerge through comparisons and hierarchies. To compare race and caste then emerges as an imperative in numerous different ways, as a challenge to various exceptionalisms, as a strategy of commensuration and claims to political modernity, as a technology for demarcating or stretching the boundaries of human rights. And yet I'm reminded of some of the storied moments of this history. Ambedkar's 1936 speech, The Annihilation of Caste, which was prepared but not delivered. The translation of Pule's slavery prepared in 1990 under the auspices of the state government of Maharashtra to deliver to Nelson Mandela when he visited Bombay. The visit never took place. The book was translated and printed, but not delivered. What would it mean for these historical comparisons to finally arrive as a legitimate space for scholarly inquiry, where we can go beyond surface claims of equivalence and refuse to instrumentalize one history of oppression in order to spotlight the other? Thank you. This is just 
just so exciting. Yogitan, actually, I feel like I'm a student in your class rather than your commentator, which is awkward because now I'm supposed to try and say something other than that. Uh, just on. Yeah. Oh, no. 